The Wild Beast Tamer, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Wild Beast Tamer, Part 1. We visit a clear resort for circus people and talk with a trainer of elephants. Well down on 4th Avenue, below the bird fanciers, the rat catchers, the antique shops and the dingy hotels where lion tamers put up, is Billy's Place, the great rendezvous of the country for circus folk, and here any afternoon or evening, especially in the dull winter time, you may find heroes of the flying trapeze, bereft of show-ring trappings, playing monotonous euchre with keepers of the cages, or sitting in convivial and reminiscent groups that include everything from the high salaried star down to some humble tutor in the band at present looking for a job. All kinds of acrobats come to Billy's, all kinds of animal men, everybody who has to do with a show, barring the owners. If a Norwegian wrestler wants to get track of an Egyptian giant, he goes to Billy's. If an elephant trainer needs a new helper, he goes to Billy's. It is at once a club, a haven, a post office, and a general intelligence bureau for members of this wandering and fascinating profession. It was my fortune recently to spend an evening at Billy's, and I had as companion a veteran circus man, able to explain things. After taking in the externals, which were commonplace enough save for a big top celebrities ranged along the walls in tiers of photographs, we sat us down where a man in a blue shirt was telling how a lioness and three cubs got out of a cage somewhere one afternoon just after the performance. It seems one of the cubs had been playing with a loose bolt, and the first thing anyone knew, there they were, all four of them, skipping about free in the menagerie tent. The story detailed various efforts to get the lioness back into her cage. Prodding, lassoing, shouting, and the total failure of these, because she would neither leave her cubs nor let them be taken from her. Finally the situation grew serious, for the evening performance was coming on, and it was quite sure there would be no audience with an uncaged lioness on the premises. So it became a matter of business in this wise. A lioness worth a few hundred dollars against an audience worth a couple of thousand. Word was sent to the head of the show, and back came the order, kill her. In vain the keeper pleaded for one more trial. He would risk a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with hot irons. The head of the show said no. The lioness was desperate, and he wouldn't have his men expose their lives. It was a case of shoot her, and do it quick. Of course, that settled it. They did shoot her, and as the blue-shirted man described the execution, I was impressed by his tenderness in speaking of that poor defiant mother, and then of the three little cubs that howled for a, a whole month, sir, and looked so sad it made us boys feel like murderers. Blamed if it didn't. Another man, with steely grey eyes and a stubble of beard, ventured the opinion that they must have had a pretty poor quality of gumption in that outfit, or someone would have got the lioness into her cage. He was mighty sure George Conklin would have done it. George was over in Europe now, handling big cats for the Barnum show. There wasn't anything George didn't know about lions. "'Why, I'll give you a case,' said he. "'We were showing out in Kansas, and one night a cage fell off the circus train, it became unlashed or something as she swung round a curve, and when we stuck our heads out of the sleeper there were a pair of greenish burning eyes coming down the side of the track, and we could hear a rrrr, something between a bark and a roar, that didn't cheer us up any, you better believe. Then George Conklin yelled, By the Lord, it's Mary. Come on, boys, we must get her. And we went out. Mary was a full-grown lioness, and she was loose there in the darkness, out on a bare prairie, without a house or fence anywhere for miles. "'Hold on,' said I. "'How did your circus train happen to stop when the cage fell off?' With indulgent smile he explained that a circus train running at night always has guards on the watch, who wave quick lanterns to the engineer in any emergency. 
"'Well,' continued the man, "'George Conklin had that cage fixed up "'and the lioness safe inside within forty minutes by the clock. "'Do? Well, it was easy enough. "'We unrolled about a hundred yards of side-wall tenting "'and carried it toward the lioness, "'with a line of men holding up a length of canvas "'so it formed a long moving fence, "'and every man carried a flaming kerosene torch.' There was a picture to remember, that line of heads over the canvas wall, and the flaring lights gradually circling round the lioness, who backed, growling and switching her tail, backed away from the fire, till presently, as we closed in, we had her in the mouth of a funnel of canvas, with torches everywhere except just at her back where the open cage was. Then Conklin spoke sharp to her, just as they were in the ring, and snapped his whip and the next thing Miss Mary was safe behind the bars. It was a pretty neat job, I can tell you. During this talk a broad-shouldered man had joined the group, and my companion whispered that he was Bill Newman, the famous elephant trainer. Mr. Newman at once showed an interest in the discussion, and agreed that there are times when you can do nothing with an animal but kill it. Now there was old Albert, said he. A fine ten-foot tusker that I'd seen growing up from a baby, and I was fond of him too, but I had to kill him. It was in eighty-five, and we were showing in New Hampshire. Albert had been cranky for a long time, never with me but with the other men, and in Nashua he slammed a keeper against the ground so hard that he died the next morning just as we were coming into Keene. That settles it, and the afternoon performance... Mr. Hutchinson announced in the ring that we had an elephant on our hands under sentence of death, and he was willing to turn this elephant over to the local rifle corps if they felt equal to the execution. You see, he had heard there was a company of sharpshooters in Keene, and it struck him that this was a good way to be rid of a bad elephant and get some advertising at the same time. Well, those Keene riflemen weren't going to be left by a showman. They said to bring on the elephant and they'd take care of him. So after the performance I led old Albert back to a piece of woods behind the tent and we hitched tackle to his four legs and stretched him out between four trees so he couldn't move. And then the rifle corps lined him up about twelve paces off ready to shoot. That elephant knew he was going to die, sir. Yes, he knew it perfectly well, but he was a lot cooler than some of those riflemen. Why, there was one fellow on the end of the line shaking so he could hardly aim. You see, they were afraid old Albert would break loose and come at them if they only wounded him. Do you mean know where to shoot? I called out. We're going to shoot at his head, answered the captain. All right, said I. You'd better send for lanterns and more ammunition. You're liable to be shooting here all night. Then where shall we shoot? asked the captain. "'That depends,' I answered. "'If you can send your bullet straight into his eye "'at a forty-five degree up slant, "'you'll fix him all right. "'If you don't hit his eye, "'you can shoot the rest of his head full of holes "'and he won't care. "'You've got to reach his brain, "'and that's a little thing in where I'm telling you.' "'That made the captain do some thinking, "'for Albert looked awful big "'and his eye looked awful small, "'and they didn't want to bungle the job. Well, said he, is there any other place we can aim except his eye? Aim here, I told him, and I drew a circle with a piece of chalk just back of his left foreleg, a circle about as big as your hand. When a man has cut up as many elephants as I have, he knows where the heart is, but most men don't. After this there was a hush, while the whole crowd held its breath, and old Albert looked at me out of his little eyes as much to say, "'So you're going to let him do me after all, are you?' "'And then came the sharp command, ready fire, "'and thirty-two rifle balls started for that chalk mark. "'And how many do you think got there? Five out of thirty-two, I counted. "'But five did the business. "'Poor old Albert dropped without a sound or a struggle. "'Newman sighs at the memory.' "'Isn't there some exaggeration?' I asked, "'in what you said about shooting an elephant full of holes without killing him.' "'Exaggeration,' answered Newman. "'Not a bit of it. "'Why, there was an elephant named Samson with the coal show, "'and he got loose once in a town out at Idaho "'and ran through the streets crazy mad, 
killing horses, smashing into houses, ripping the whole place wide open. Well, sir, they shot at him with Winchesters, revolvers, shotguns, every darn thing they had, until that elephant was full of lead. Then he went off all right the next day, and never seemed any the worse for it, up to the day he was burned to death with the Barnum show at Bridgeport. The mention of this catastrophe reminded me of reports that wild beasts in a burning menagerie are silent before the flames, and I asked Mr. Newman if he believed it. "'No, sir,' he said, "'it isn't true. I was in Bridgeport when the Barnum show burnt up, and I never heard such roaring and screaming. It was awful. Even the rhinoceros, which can't make much noise, was running round the yard grunting and squealing, with flames four foot high shooting up from his back and sides. You see, a rhinoceros is almost solid fat, and as soon as he caught fire he burnt like an oil tank. Didn't you save any lions or tigers? He shook his head. Wasn't any use trying. They'd have been shot by policemen as fast as we could get them out. Besides, we couldn't get them out. We concentrated on elephants and saved all the herd but five. There were three elephants all over Bridgeport that night, and a queer thing was we had to look sharp that some of the elephants we'd saved didn't run back into the fire. You know how horses will go back into a burning stable? Well, elephants are just the same. That's how we lost the white elephant. She walked straight into the blaze when she might just as well have walked out through an open door. By this time most of the company at Billy's had gathered round to listen, for Newman was a veteran among veterans, and was now in the full swing of reminiscence. He went back to his earliest days, back to Putnam Country, New York, where young men might well be drawn into the circus life, so many famous showmen has this region produced, Jim Kelly and Seth P. Howes and Langway and the Baileys. I started with Langway, the old lion tamer, said Newman, and he was one of the best. I'll never forget once what he told me when he was breaking in a den of lions and tigers. There were three lions and two tigers, all fully grown and fresh from the jungle. Bill said he, I'm an old man, and this is my last den. I won't break in no more big cats. But I'll break this den in so they'll never work for another man after I've gone. It'll look easy what I do, and folks'll want you to tackle em, Bill, but don't you never do it, for if you do these cats will chew you up sure. Well, he worked that den in great shape for a year or so, and then he died, and I minded his words. I let those lions and tigers alone. They hired a lion tamer named Davis to work em, and sure enough he got chewed up bad just to the old man said he would. And the end of it was that nobody ever worked that den again. It couldn't be done, although they'd been like kittens with Langway. What he did to them's always been a mystery. Newman paused, as impressive storytellers do, and then drawing once more upon his memories, he told how a terrible death came to poor Patsy Ma, as he was drilling a herd of elephants once in winter quarters at Columbus, Ohio. It was the day before Thanksgiving, he said. I'll never forget it, and a big bull elephant named Sid took the order wrong, went right face instead of left face or something, and Patsy got mad and hooked him pretty hard. Some think it was Patsy's fault, because he gave the wrong order by mistake, and Sid did what he said, while the other elephants did the thing he meant to say. Anyhow, Sid turned on Patsy and let him have both tusks, brass balls and eye, right through the body. Killed him in half a minute. Why, oh, sir, they took Patsy's watch out through his back. That's the sort of thing you're liable to run up against. Did they kill Sid? I asked. No, they gave him the benefit of the doubt. You see, it ain't square to blame an elephant for obeying orders. Then came the story of how they killed bad old pilot at the Madison Square Gardens back in 1883. Fought his hard spirit all night long with clubs and pitchforks and prods and hot irons, one hundred men flaying and jabbling in relays against a poor banned animal that died rather than yield, died without a sound as day was breaking. Yes, sir, said Newman, he never squealed, he wouldn't squeal, 
and three minutes afore he died he nearly killed me with a swing of his trunk. Oh, he was game all right, Pilot was. Newman came back to the difficulty of working animals broken in by another tamer. But he declared that the thing can be done in some cases if the new tamer has in him that unknown something to which all wild beasts submit. His own wife, for example, after a dozen years of peaceful married life, determined one day that she would make a herd of eight big Asiatic elephants obey her, a thing no woman had ever attempted. And within three weeks she did, and drilled the herd in public for years afterward. In fact, became a greater star than her husband. All of which was most unusual, and entirely due to her exceptional nerve and physical power. Why, sir, said Newman proudly, she was six foot tall and built like an athlete. She, she only died a few years ago, and, and, that gulp and the catch in his voice told the whole story. This was no longer a dauntless elephant trainer, but a stricken, heartbroken man. What now were the glories of the ring to him? His wife was dead. End of the Wild Beast Tamer, Part 1「The Wild Beast Tamer Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Wild Beast Trainer Part Two. Methods of Lion Tamers and the Story of Brutus's Attack on Mr. Bostock. The wild beast tamer, as generally pictured, is a mysterious person who stalks about sternly in high boots and possesses a remarkable power with the eye that makes lions and tigers quail at his look and shrink away. He rules by fear and the crack of his whip is supposed to bring memories of torturing points and red-hot irons. Such is the storybook lion tamer, and I may as well say at once that outside of story-books he has small existence. There is scarcely any truth in this theory of hate, for hate and conquest by fear. It is no more fear that makes a lion walk on a ball than it is fear that makes a horse pull a wagon. It is habit. The lion is perfectly willing to walk on the ball, and he has reached that mind not by cruel treatment, but by force of his trainer's patience and kindness and superior intelligence. Of course, a wild beast tamer should have a quick eye and a delicate sense of hearing, so that he may be warned of a sudden spring at him, or a rush from behind, and it is important that he be a sober man, for alcohol breaks a nerve or gives a false courage worse than folly. But the quality on which he must chiefly rely, and which alone can make him a great tamer, not a second-rate bungler, is a genuine fondness for his animals. This does not mean that the animals will necessarily be fond of the tamer. Some will be fond of him, some will be indifferent to him, some will fear and hate him. Nor will the tamer's fondness protect him from fang or claw. We shall see that there is danger always, accident often, but without the fondness there would be greater danger and more frequent accident. A fondness for lions and tigers gives sympathy for them. Sympathy gives understanding of them, and understanding gives mastery of them, or as much mastery as is possible. What but this fondness would keep a tamer constantly with his animals, not only in the public show, the easiest part, but in the dens and treacherous runway, in the strange night hours, in the early morning rump, when none is looking, where there is no reason for being with them except the tamer's own joy in it. I do not propose now to present in detail the methods of taming wild beasts, rather what happens after they are tamed, but I may say that a lion tamer always begins by spending weeks or months in gaining a new animal's confidence. Day after day he will stand for a long time outside the cage, merely looking at the lion, talking to him, impressing upon the beast the general familiarity with his voice and person, and each time as he goes away, he is careful to toss in a piece of meat as a present memento of his visit. 
Later he ventures inside the bars, carrying some simple weapon, a whip, a rod, perhaps a broom, which is more formidable than one might be supposed, through the jab of its sharp bristles. One time he used a common chair with much success against unbroken lions. If the creature came at him, there were the four legs in his face, and soon the chair came to represent boundless power to the ignorant lion. He feared it and hated it, as was seen on one occasion when the tamer left it in the cage, and the lion promptly tore it into splinters. Days may pass before the lion will let his tamer do more than merely stay inside the cage at a distance. Very well, the tamer stays there. He waits hour after hour, week after week, until the time comes when the lion will let him move nearer, will permit the touch of his hand, will come forward for a piece of meat, and at last treat him like a friend, so that finally he may sit there quite at ease and even read his newspaper, as one man did. Lastly begins the practice of tricks. The lion must spring to a pedestal and be fed. He must jump from one pedestal to another and be fed. He must keep a certain pose and be fed. A bit of meat is always the final argument, and the tamer wins, if he wins at all, for sometimes he fails, by patience and kindness. There is no use getting angry with a lion, said a well-known trainer to me, and there is no use in carrying a revolver. If you shoot a lion or injure him with any weapon, it is your loss, for you must buy another lion, and the chances are that he will kill you anyway if he starts to do it. The thing is to keep him from starting. I once had a talk with the lion tamer Philadelphia on the subject of breaking lions, and heard from him what need a tamer has of patience. I have sat in a lion's cage, said Philadelphia, two or three hours every day for weeks, years for months, waiting for him to come out of his sulky corner and take a piece of meat from me. And that was only a start towards mastery. Wouldn't he attack you? Philadelphia smile. He did at first, but that was soon settled. It isn't hard to best the lion if you got it right. I usually carry a pair of clubs. Some men prefer a broom, because the bristles do great work in a lion's face without injuring him. But the finest weapon you have against a fighting lion is a hose of water. That stops his fight, and you mustn't have the water too cold, or he might get pneumonia. You mightn't think it, but lions are very delicate. In using the clubs, you must be careful not to strike them hard across the back. You'd be surprised how easy it is to break a lion's backbone, especially if it's a young lion. In support of this statement that lions are delicate, I remember hearing old John Smith, director of the Central Park Menagerie, set forth a list of lions' ailments and the coddling and doctoring that they require. Lion medicine is usually administered in the food or drink, but there are cases requiring more heroic measures, and then the animal must be bound down before the doctors can treat him. It should be remembered that lions in city menageries are more dangerous than circus lions, since they are either wild ones brought straight from the jungle and never tamed, or rebellious ones, anarchist lions, that have been turned against their tamers, perhaps killed them, and have finally been sold to any zoological garden that would take them. When we have to rope a lion down to doctor him, said Smith, we drop nooses through the top bars and catch his four legs, and let down one round his body. Then we haul these fast, and there you are. You can feel his pulse, or give him stuff, or pull one of his teeth, or anything. It must be pretty hard to pull a lion's tooth, I remarked. Not very. Here's the forceps I use. You see, it isn't very big. This is for the upper jaw, and that other one is for the lower jaw. I made some remark meant to be facetious about not giving the lions gas, but the old man took me up sharply. Certainly we give them gas. How in the world do you think we operate on them? They get chloroform, same as a person. I have a bag that fits over the lion's head and pulls up tight with a string. In the bag is a sponge saturated with chloroform, and the first you know off goes Mr. Lion into a quiet sleep, and you can do what you like. 
"'but you have to be mighty careful not to give him too much "'and look sharp as his heart action, "'or you'll have a dead lion on your hand. "'Say, I found out one thing, chloroforming lions, "'that lots of doctors don't know. "'It's this, that if a lion comes back hard to consciousness "'after you've put him to sleep, "'you can help things along by catching hold of his tail "'and heaving him up on his head. "'That sends the blood down to his brain where you want it.' and pretty soon you'll see his muscles begin to twitch, and back he comes. I told a doctor about this once, and he said he'd done the very same thing with patience. Coming again to the need of patience, let me quote my friend Bill Newman. Why, he says, I've spent weeks and weeks teaching an elephant to ring a bell, just that one thing. You have to sit by him hour after hour, giving him the bell in his trunk, and giving it to him again when he drops it, and then again and again for a whole morning, and then for many mornings until he gets the idea and rings it right. It's the same way teaching an elephant to fan himself or teaching tricks to a clown elephant. You have to wait and wait and never give up. Once an elephant understands what you want, he'll do it, but it's awful hard sometimes making him understand. How do you teach them to stand on their heads and on their hind legs, I asked with the same kind of patience and with tackle. Just heave them or roll them over the way they're supposed to go, and then keep at it. Some learn quicker than others. Once in a while you get a mean one, and then look out. An instance of the affection felt for wild beasts by their tamers is offered in the case of Madame Bianca, the French tamer, who in the winter of 1900 was with the Bostock Wild Animal Show, giving daily exhibitions in Baltimore, where her skill and daring with lions and tigers earned wide admiration. It will be remembered how fire descended suddenly on this menagerie one night and destroyed the animals among fearful scenes, and in the morning Bianca stood in the ruins and looked upon the charred bodies of her pets. Had she lost her dearest friend, she could scarce have shown deeper grief. She was in despair and declared that she would never tame another group. She would leave show business. And when the menagerie was stocked afresh with lion and tigers, Bianca would not go near their cage. These were lions indeed, but not her lions. And she shook her head and mourned for Bowser, the handsomest lioness in captivity, and Spitfire, and Juliet, and the black-maned Brutus. This recalls a story that Mr. Bostock told me, showing how Bianca's fondness for her lions persisted even in the face of fierce attack. It was in Kansas City, and for some days Spitfire had been working badly, so that on this particular afternoon Bianca had spent two hours in the big exhibition cage trying to get the lioness into good form. But Spitfire remained sullen and refused to do one perfectly easy thing, a jump over a pedestal. "'Ask Mr. Bostock to come here, please,' called Bianca, finally quite at her wit's end, with the performance hour approaching and hers the chief act. To go on with Spitfire in rebellion would never do, for the spirit of mischief spreads among lions and tigers exactly as it spreads among children. Spitfire must jump over that pedestal. Mr. Bostock arrived presently and at once entered the cage, carrying two whips, as is the custom. There is something in this man that impresses animals and tamers alike. It is not only that he is big and strong and loves his animals and does not fear them, that would scarcely account for his extraordinary prestige, which is his rather because he knows lions and tigers as only a man who has literally spent his life with them. From father and grandfather he has inherited precious and unusual law of the cages. He was born in a menagerie, he married the daughter of a menagerie owner, he sleeps always within a few feet of the dens, he eats with roars of lions in his ears, and his principle is, and always has been, that he will enter any cage at any time if a real need calls him, which has led to many a situation like that created now by Spitfire's disobedience. There were many groups in the menagerie at this time, each with its regular tamer, and while Bostock as owner and director watched over them all, it often happened that months would pass without his putting a foot inside this or that particular cage. And in the present case he was practically a stranger to the four lions and tiger now ranged about on their pedestals in a semicircle thirty feet in diameter, with big Brutus in the middle, 
and snarling spitfire at one end. Well, said Mr. Bostock, explaining what happened, I saw that Bianca had made a mistake in handling Spitfire from too great a distance. She had stood about seven feet away, so I stepped three feet closer and lifted one of my whips. There were just two things that Spitfire could do. She could spring at me and have trouble, or she could jump over the pedestal and have no trouble. She growled a little, looked at me, and then she jumped over that pedestal like a lady. I had called her bluff. The rest was easy. I put her through some other tricks, circled her around the cage a couple of times, and brought her back to her corner. Then, just then, as she crouched there and snarled at me, I played a tattoo with my whip handle on the floor just in front of her. It was sort of a flourish to finish off with, and was one thing too much, for in doing this I turned quite away from the rest of the group, and made Brutus think that I meant to hurt the lioness. He said to himself, Ha! He is a stranger in our cage, taking a whip to spit fire. I'll just settle him. And before I could move, he sprang twenty feet off his pedestal, set his fangs in my thigh, and dragged me over to Bianca as if to prove his gallantry. Then the Frenchwoman did a clever thing. She clasped her arms round his big neck, drew his head up, and fired a revolver close to his ear. Of course she fired only a blank cartridge, but it brought Brutus to obedience, for that was Bianca's regular signal in the act for the lion to take their pedestal. And the habit of the work was so strong in the old fellow that he dropped me and jumped back to his place. There wasn't any more to it except that I lay five weeks in bed with my wounds. But this will show you how Bianca loved those lions. She wouldn't let me lift a hand to punish Brutus. Of course I called for irons as soon as I got up, and wounded or not, I would have taught Mr. Brutus a few things before I left that cage, if I could have had my way. But Bianca pleaded for him so hard, while she actually cried, that I hadn't the heart to go against her. She said it was partly my own fault for turning my back, which was true, and that Brutus was a good lion, and had only tried to defend his mate, and a lot more, with tears and teasing, till I let him off though I knew I could never enter Brutus's cage again after leaving it without showing myself master. That's always the way with lions. If you once lose the upper hand, you can never get it back. End of The Wild Beast Tamer Part 2「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」「ワールドビーストタイムパート3」I observed many little instances of the tamer's affections for his animals. I could see it in the constant fondling of the big cats by Bostock himself, and by Bonavita, his chief tamer, and even by the cage grooms. And no matter how great the crush of business, there was always time for visiting a sick lioness out in the stable, who would never be better, poor thing, but should have all possible comforts for her last days. And late one afternoon I stood by while Bonavita led a powerful yellow-maned lion into the arena cage and held him as a mother might hold a suffering child, while the doctor, reaching cautiously through the bars, cut away a growth from the beast's left eye. It is true they used a local anaesthetic, but even so it hurt the lion, and Bonavita's position as he knelt and stroked the big head and spoke soothing words seemed to me as far as possible from secure. Yet it was plain that his only thought was to ease the lion's pain. I couldn't have done that with all my lions, Bonavita said after the operation. But this one is specially trained. You know, he lets me put my head in his mouth. Bonavita is a handsome, slender man, with dark hair and eyes, quite the type of a Spanish gentleman. And I liked him not only for his mastery of twenty odd lions, but because he had a gentle manner and was modest about his work. According to Mr. Bostock, Bonavita has but two strong affections, 
one for his old mother and one for his lions. Occasionally I could get him aside for a talk, and that was a thing worth doing. People ask me such foolish questions about wild beasts, he said one day. For instance, they want to know which would win in a fight, a lion or a tiger. I tell them that it is like asking which would win in a fight, an Irishman or a Scotsman. It all depends on the particular tiger you have and the particular lion. Animals are just as different as men. Some are good, some bad, some you can trust and some you can't trust. Which is the most dangerous lion you have? I inquired. Well, said he, that's one of those questions I don't know how to answer. If you ask which lion has been the most dangerous so far, I should say Denver, because he tore my right arm one day so badly that they nearly had to cut it off. Still, I think Ingomar is my most dangerous lion. Although he hasn't got his teeth into me yet, he's tried but missed me. It doesn't matter, though, what I think, for it may be one of these lazy, innocent-looking lions that will really kill me. They seem tame as kittens, but you can't tell what's underneath. Supposing I turn my back and one of them springs, why, it's all off. Another day, he said, a man gets more confidence every time he faces an angry lion and comes out all right. Finally, he gets so sure of his power that he does strange things. I have seen a lion coming at me and never moved, and the lion has stopped. I've had a lion strike at me, and the blow has just grazed my head, and have stood still with my whip lifted, and the lion has gone off afraid. One day in the ring a lion caught my left arm in his teeth as I passed between two pedestals. I didn't pull away, but stamped my foot and cried out, Baltimore, what do you mean? The stamp of my foot was the lion's cue to get off the pedestal, and Baltimore loosed his jaws and jumped down. His habit of routine was stronger than his desire to bite me. Again, Bonavita explained that there is some strange virtue in carrying in the left hand a whip which is never used. The tamer strikes with his right hand whip when it is necessary, but only lifts his left hand whip and holds it as a menace over the lion. And it is likely, Bonavita thinks, that to strike with that reserve whip would be to spell the lion's idea that it stands for some mysterious force beyond his daring. You'll see, lions aren't very intelligent, he said. They don't understand what men are, or what they want. That is our hardest work, to make the lion understand what we want. As soon as he knows that he expected to sit on a pedestal, he is willing enough to do it, especially if he gets some meat. But it often takes weeks before he finds out what we are driving at. You can see what slow brains lions have, or tigers either, by watching them fight for a stick or a tin cup. They couldn't get more excited over a piece of meat. One of the worst wounds I ever got came from going into a lion's den after an overcoat that he had dragged away from a foolish spectator who was poking at him. I finally got Bonavita to tell me about the time when the lion Denver attacked him. It was during a performance at Indianapolis in the fall of 1900, and the trouble came at the runway end where the two circular passages from the cages open up, up on an iron bridge that leads to the show rings. Bonavita had just driven seven lions into this narrow space, and was waiting for the attendants to open the iron barred door, when Denver sprang at him and set his teeth in his right arm. This stirred the other lions, and they all turned on Bonavita but fortunately only two could reach him because of the crush of bodies. He was a tamer in sorest need, for the weight of the lions kept the iron doors from opening and barred out the rescuers. In the audience was wildest panic, and the building resounded with shouts and screams and the roars of angry lions. Women fainted, men rushed forward brandishing revolvers, but dared not shoot, and for a few minutes it seemed as if the tamer was doomed. But Bonavita's steady nerve saved him. As Denver opened his jaws to seize a more vital spot, the tamer drove his whip-handle far down into his red throat, and then with a cudgel passed into him, beat the brute back. The other lions followed, and this freed the iron door, which the groom straightway had opened, 
and in a moment the seven lions were leaping towards the ring as if nothing had happened. And last of all the seven came Denver, driven by Bonavita, white-faced and suffering, but the master now, and greeted with cheers and roars of applause. No one realised how badly he was hurt, for his face gave no sign. He bowed to the audience, cracked his whip, and began the act as usual. As he went on, he grew weaker, but stuck to it until he'd put the lions through four of their tricks. And then he staggered out of the ring into the arms of the doctors, who found him torn with ugly wounds that kept him for weeks in the hospital. That, I think, is an instance of the very finest lime tamer spirit. Among various meetings with tamers of animals, I recall with particular pleasure one afternoon when my friend Newman brought to see me a tamer famous in his day, George Arstingstall. I knew that Arstingstall was the first man in this country to work lions, tigers, leopards, elephants, sheep, monkeys, and various other beasts, all in a great circular cage. Also, that his fame had spread across Europe, and his daring feats been shown from London to Moscow, but I did not know what a simple, modest man he was, nor realised till then the charm of listening to a couple of circus veterans, comrades for years, talking of the old stirring days. Here were two men getting on to sixty, yet talking with the eagerness of boys about their exploits and perils under fang and claw. It was, Say, Bill, do you remember when that bull pup caught Topsy by the trunk and stampeded the stampeded the whole business do i remember george up in boston bing bang over the common and the old man wild well i guess but say george what that wasn't as bad as the stampede in troy when those four elephants cleaned out the rolling bell oh what a night let's see there was nan and and tip yes poor tip i strangled him at bridgeport you remember george he wouldn't take the poison oh he was no fool tip wasn't and I told the old man we'd have to put nurses on him and cut off his wind. I know, Bill, the old man said, it wasn't possible to strangle an elephant. And say, George, I had his wind shut off inside of three minutes after the boys began to haul. Oh, you can't beat three shave blocks, George, for finishing off a bad tusker. Well, that night in Troy those four elephants went sailing through this rolling bell, trumpeting like mad, right over the hot iron, scaring those Irishmen blue, and then smashed down the steep refuge bank into the mud. Oh, what looking elephants! Nan had her legs all burnt, and... I know, and say, Bill, do you remember where I found Tip, three miles out of Troy, standing up in a cornfield fast asleep, and two little boys on a rail fence looking at him? He'd knocked over a shanty and smashed open a barrel of whiskey, a whole barrel, Bill, and there he was sound asleep. When I saw those little boys, I made up my mind I'd found Tip. "'What you looking at, boys?' I sang out. "'Elephant, mister,' says one of the boys, careless-like. "'Like it was a common thing in Troy for elephants to be asleep in the cornfields.' "'I know, that's the way little boys act,' remarked Newman suggestively. "'Say, George, tell about the time that you took that carload of animals over the Araganis.' After some preliminaries, Mr. Hastingall responded to the invitation, and I heard a story that Victor Hugo might have turned into a masterpiece of description. It was back in the winter of 1874, and circus trains were not fitted up as completely then as they are today. Hastingstall was in charge of a car packed with a medley of animals, lions and tigers in cages, some camels, some boxes of monkeys, some hyenas, a sacred bull from Tibet, and a young male elephant, recently brought from Africa and as yet untrained. All these were on their way to Wisconsin, where the show was to make its spring opening in a couple of weeks, during which Arstingstall was expected to break the young elephant for driving in a chariot race. At the end of the car was a stove against the bitter weather, but the elephant was chained at the other end, and as they came into the mountain region, Arstingstall noticed that the elephant was suffering from cold, and at the first stop sent a man out for half a bucket of whisky, which he filled up with water and gave to the shivering animal. There is no use in giving an elephant whisky unless you give him enough. 
Now came a run of an hour and a half without stop, and during this time Arsting's store was alone in the animal car, and about as busy as he ever expects to be on this earth. The trouble began when he unloosed the elephant's chains to lead him nearer the stove, for it looked as if his ears might freeze, as happens. Indeed, an elephant's ears will sometimes freeze so hard that big pieces drop off, while a frozen tail has been known to drop off entirely. Against such chances, Arsting Stall wished to take precautions, so he led the elephant down the car, through a jumble of animals and cages, all the less prepared for mischief, as this was rather a smallish elephant, not over six feet at the shoulder, and showing only half-grown tusks. But they were sharp. Whether it was the whisky taking violent effect, or some sudden hatred for his keeper, at any rate, that elephant, long before he reached the stove, set forth upon a murderous campaign the like of which Arsting Skull had never known. Before he realised the danger, he felt the creature's trunk twisting round his neck, and he was hurled violently to the floor. There he lay helpless, while the elephant hesitated, one might fancy, whether to kneel on him and crush the life out, or run him through with his tusks. In that moment's pause, Arsting Storm made a last despairing effort, did the only thing he could do, sunk his teeth into the fleshy finger that curls round the end of an elephant's trunk and covers the opening so no invading mouse may enter and work destruction. In all an elephant's great body there is no spot so sensitive as this finger, and with a scream of pain the animal loosed his hold, whereupon Arsting saw spring behind one of the cages. But the elephant was after him in a moment, swinging his trunk and trumpeting black murder. Arsting stall dodged behind the camels, behind the sacred bull, behind the stove. The elephant followed him everywhere, profiting by his smallness, and where he could not go himself he sent his curling trunk. Arstingstall, out of breath, climbed on top of the lion's cage, thinking to find some respite, but the red-ended trunk pursued him. Once more he tried biting tactics, and as the reaching fingers swept along the cage top he seized it again in his teeth, and this time took a piece clean out of it, which was not pleasant for him, and less so for the elephant. Now came a truce of some minutes, during which the elephant put forth screaming challenges, but kept at a distance, and allowed Arstingstall to reach the bunks beside the monkey's cage. From the topmost bunk um, opened a trap-door in the car roof, the only exit as the sliding doors were bolted. He might escape here to the back of the train, but that would leave a mad elephant in possession of the car, a thing not to be thought of. Thus far the elephant's rage had been directed solely against his keeper. But the keeper had gone, he might turn to destroy the other animals, might kill the sacred bull or smash open the lion's cage. There was no telling what he might do. Arstingstall saw that his duty lay in that car. Whatever came, he must. Crash came the elephant again, and the lower berth was a wreck. And now the din became infernal, with the roaring and bellowing and chattering of the other animals. Arsting Stall did some quick thinking. There was sure death before him unless he could somehow conquer this frenzied creature, whose rushes, coming harder and harder, must soon batter down the car, for all its stout oak timbers. Oh, for a weapon, a prod of some sort. Ah, uh, like a flash, the thought came, down at the other end was a pitchfork, used for throwing fodder. There was his chance. He must get the pitchfork. For the next hour it was a fight, man against elephant, for the winning and holding of that pitchfork. There was the whole story, and some day I hope to give its details, the moves and counter-moves, the strategy of brute against human, the conflict of brain against crude force. Casting store won, but by what patience and quiet nerve he alone knew. Foot by foot, cage by cage, he worked his way down the length of that car. The elephant now on the defensive one would say, as if he realised what was planning. The man watching, resolute, biding his time, ready for a sudden rush, forced now and again to use his teeth upon that murderous trunk. Finally he got the pitchfork, and for a moment, what a moment that was, held four prongs of flashing steel before the elephant's eyes, red burning and submissive. It was all over now, the battle was won. The animal knew, and stood still, 
awaiting the blow. Down came the weapon, and right through the trunk went those four sharp points, down into the timbers underfoot. Then Arstingstall braced the handle under a wall beam, so that the elephant was nailed fast to the floor, nose down. And then the brute squealed at his submission. Three weeks later, Arstingstall drove that elephant, perfectly broken, in a chariot race and for years after there was not a better little bull in the herd than he. End of Wild Beast Tamers, Part 3《The Wild Beast Tamer, Part 4 》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat The Wild Beast Tamer, Part 4 We see Mr. Bostock matched against a wild lion and hear about the Tiger Rajah. Whenever I made the round of cages with Mr. Bostock, I was struck by the fierce behaviour of a certain male lion with a brown and yellow mane. The young Wallace, they called him who would set up a horrible snarling as soon as we came near, and rush at the bars as if to tear them down. And no matter how great the crowd, his wicked yellow eyes would always follow Bostock, and his deep purring roar would continue and break into furious barks if the tamer approached the bars. Then his jaws would open and the red muzzle curl back from his tusks, and again and again he would strike the floor with blows that would crush a horse. "'Doesn't love me, does he?' said Bostock one day. "'What's the matter with him?' I asked. "'Why, nothing, only he's a wild lion, never been tamed, you know. "'And I took him in the ring one day. "'He hasn't forgotten it, have you, old boy? "'Ha!' Bostock stamped his foot suddenly, "'and young Wallace crouched back, snarling still, "'a picture of hatred and fear. "'Yes,' went on Bostock, "'he's wild enough.' You see, after the fire I had to get animals from pretty much everywhere and get them quick. Did some lively cabling, I can tell you. And pretty soon there were lions and tigers and leopards, and oh, everything from sacred bulls down to snakes, chasing across the ocean. And more than half of them had been loose in the jungle six months ago. It was a case of hustle, and we took what they sent us. Then we had fun breaking them. Ask Madame Morelli if we didn't. She's in hospital now from the claws of that fellow. He pointed to a sleepy-looking jaguar. Tell you how I came to take this wild lion into the ring. I had a press agent who'd been announcing out west what a wonder I was with wild beasts, and how I wasn't afraid of anything on legs and so on. That was all very well when I was in Baltimore, but when I joined my other show after the fire... Of course, I had to live up to my reputation. And when they got up a travelling men's benefit out in Indianapolis and asked me to go into the ring with young Wallace, why, well, there wasn't anything to do but go in. It wasn't quite so funny, though, as it seemed, for I might as well have taken a lion fresh from the wilds of Africa. Mr. Bostock smiled at the memory. Well, I did the thing and got through all right. Young Wallace hasn't forgotten what happened to him. I got the best of him by a trick, had a little shelter cage placed inside the big arena cage, and at first I stood in the small one and let the lion come at me. Oh, you'd better believe he came. I thought sure he'd jump clean over the thing and land on me, for there was no roof to my cage, only sides of wire netting. He didn't quite do it, though, and as soon as I saw he was getting rattled, I stepped out quick and went at him hard with whip and club and I drove him all over the ring, and the people went crazy, for he was the maddest lion you ever saw. That was all right as far as it went, but the people wanted more. They got to be out and out bloodthirsty here in Indianapolis. Wanted me to go in the ring with Ranger, that big tiger. See over there? Come up, Ranger. Beauty, isn't he? Doesn't even pay any special attention to me, does he? Nearly killed me just the same. Look, he lifted his cap and showed wide strips of plaster on his head. Point about Raja was that he'd killed one of my keepers a couple of weeks before. Poor fellow got into his cage by mistake. 
and now these Indianapolis folks wanted to see me handle him. Between you and me, this keeper wasn't the first man Rajah had killed, and I didn't care much for the job. As for my wife, well, you could imagine how she felt when she heard I was going in with Rajah. On the morning of the performance I decided to have a rehearsal and called on a few picked men to help me. I knew by the way he had killed his keeper that Rajah would go at my head if he attacked me at all, so I rigged up a mask of iron wire and wore this strapped over my head like a little barrel. Then I drove him into the arena and began while the others looked on anxiously. It's queer, sir, but that tiger went through his tricks as nice as you please, back and forth, upon his pedestal and down again, everything just as he used to in the old days before he went bad. Never bulked, never turned on me, just as good as gold. Soon as I was satisfied, I drove him across the bridge and down the runway towards his den. I came about a dozen feet behind him, carrying a long wooden shield as we generally do in a narrow place. Rajah reached his cage all right and went in. You see, he couldn't go down the runway any farther, for the door opening outward barred the passage. Behind that door I had stationed a keeper, with orders to close it as soon as Rajah went inside. But Rajah went in so silently that the keeper didn't know, the peepholes in the door being too high for him to see very well. The result was that the cage door stood open for a few seconds after the tiger had gone in. It seems a little thing, but it nearly cost me my life. For when I came up, Rajah's head was right back of the open door, and when I reached out my hand to close the door, he sprang at me, and in a second had me down, with his teeth in my arm, and his claws digging into my head through openings in the mask. Then you'd better believe there was a fight in the runway. The keepers rushed in, Bonavita rushed in, they shot at him with revolvers, they jabbed him with irons, they pounded him with clubs and one of the blows that Rajah dodged knocked me senseless. Well, they got me out finally. I guess the mask saved my life. But I didn't take Rajah into the ring that evening, and Rajah won't be seen in the ring any more. He's made trouble enough. Why, well, the things I could tell you about that tiger would fill a book. Some of these things he did tell me, for I brought the talk back to Rajah whenever the chance offered. I well remember, for instance, the occasion when I heard how Rajah once got out of his cage and chased the quagga, one of those queer little animals that are half zebra and half mule. It was late at night and we had entered the runway, Mr. Bostock and I, after the performance, for he wanted me to realise the perils of this narrow bordered lane that circles all the dens and leads the lions into the ring. It is indeed a terrifying place, a low, dimly lighted passage curving constantly so that you can see ahead scarcely twenty feet and always turning a slow corner always peering ahead uneasily and listening what is that a soft tread a glow of greenish eyeballs who can tell when a bolt may slip or a board give way so many things have happened in these runways of course a lion has no business to be out of his den but suppose he is Suppose you meet him, now, there. Well, it was there that I heard the story. Bonavita, it appears, was standing on the bridge one morning when there arose a fearful racket in the runway, and looking in he saw the quagga tearing towards him. He concluded that someone had unfastened the door and was just preparing to check the animal when around the corner came Rajah in full pursuit. Bonavita stepped back drew his revolver, and as the tiger rushed past, fired a blank cartridge, thinking thus to divert him from the quagga. But Rajah paid not the slightest heed, and in long bounds came out into the arena hard after the terrified quadruped, which was galloping now with the speed of despair. A keeper who was sweeping clambered up the iron sides and anxiously watched the race from the top. Bonavita, powerless to interfere, watched from the bridge. Of all the races ever run in the circus, this was the most remarkable. It was a race for life, as the quagga knew and the tiger intended. Five times they circled the arena, Rajah gazing always, but never enough for a spring. In the sixth turn, however, he judged the distance right, and straight away a black and yellow body shot through the air in true aim at the prey. 
whereupon the quagga did the only thing a quagga could do, let out both hind legs in one straight tremendous kick, and they do say a quagga can kick the eyes out of a fly. At any rate, in this case, a pair of nervous little heels caught the descending tiger squarely under the lower jaw and put him to sleep like a nice little lullaby. And that was the end of it. The quagga chopped back into his cage. Bonavita put up his revolver. The frightened sweeper climbed down from the bars, and Raja was hauled back ignominiously to his den. Here we have three instances showing the extreme importance of little things in a menagerie. A keeper opens the door number 13 instead of door number 14, and is straightaway killed. A screw loose in a bolt fastening, and presto, a tiger is at large. A watcher at a peephole looks away for a moment, and a life goes into jeopardy. It is always so, and I will let Mr. Bostock tell how a little thing gave Raja his first longing to kill. It was several years ago, said he, when I was running a wagon show in England. I remember we were about a mile and a half out of a certain town when this thing happened. For some reason, Raja had been transferred to a bear wagon, and we ought to have examined it more carefully, for bears are the worst fellows in the world to damage a cage by ripping up the timbers. It seems as if nothing can resist their claws and teeth. And this particular cage was in such a bad shape that Raja managed to get out of it. I knew something must be wrong when I saw the big elephant wagon that headed the procession go tearing away with its six horses on a dead run under the driver's lash. No wonder the driver was scared, for he had turned his head and seen the two draught horses that followed him down on the ground, with Raja tearing at one of them, and the other dead. It wasn't a pretty sight when we got there, and it wasn't an easy job either, capturing Raja. I don't know what we should have done if he had not been for a long-haired fellow in the show called Mustang Ned, who came up with a coil of rope and lassoed the tiger. Then we tangled him up in netting and finally got him into one of the shifting cages. But after that he was never the same tiger. You wouldn't think there was a time when Raja used to ride around the tent on an elephant's back, with only a little black boy to guard him. What? Outside the iron ring? Yes, sir, right among the women and children. He did that twice a day for over a year. Might be doing it yet if the black boy hadn't been so careful of his white trousers. His white trousers? That's right. You see, this boy rode on the elephant behind Raja, and he wore long black boots and a fine white suit. Made quite a picture. And he didn't like to rub his trousers against the tiger, for an animal's back is naturally oily. He used to tuck his legs under a lion's skin that Raja rode on, and wrap it round him like a carriage robe. Well, one day as we were going round, the nigger lost his balance, and tumbled off the elephant, pulling the lion's skin with him, and of course that dragged Raja along too. The first thing we knew, there was a big tiger on the ground, and people running around screaming. Pleasant, wasn't it? In another minute we'd have had a panic, but by good luck I was there, and caught Raja quickly around the neck, and held him till the others got a rope on him. Then we had a time getting him back on the elephant. First I tried to make him spring up from a high pedestal, but he wouldn't spring. Next I had them work a ladder under Raja, so he sat on it, and then with two men at one end and me at the other, we lifted him slowly level with our shoulders, level with their head, and just there the tiger gave a vicious growl, and the two men lowered their end. That made him work up towards my end, and in a second I had Raja's face close to my face, and both hands occupied with the ladder. I couldn't do a thing, and the only question was what he would do. He looked at me, looked at the elephant, and then struck out hard and quick, missing me only by a hair. In fact, he didn't miss me entirely, for one of his claws just reached the corner of my eye. See, I have the scar still but he jumped on the elephant, and we kept the mastery that day. Still, it was a bad business, and I saw we couldn't take such chances again. That was Raja's last ride. End of the Wild Beast Trainer, Part 4
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat The Wild Beast Tamer, Part 5 We spend a night among the wild beasts and see the dangerous lion, Black Prince. The general opinion among wild beast tamers is that the tiger is more to be feared than the lion. The one will kill a man as easily as the other, but the lion gives fair warning of his murderous intention by rushing at his victim with a roar, whereas the tiger, true representative of the cat tribe, sneaks up with a semblance of affectionate purr, only to set his fangs suddenly into the very life of his victim. The lion has somewhat greater muscular power than the tiger, but the latter has greater quickness. The tamer Philadelphia once told me that he had seen a lion fasten his fangs in the shoulders of a dead horse and drag the carcass, weighing perhaps a thousand pounds, a distance of twenty feet. If a lion and a strong horse were to pull in opposite directions, the horse would drag the lion backward with comparative ease. But if the lion were hitched behind the horse, facing in the same direction, and were allowed to exert his strength in backing, he would easily pull the horse down upon its haunches. So much greater is his strength when exerted backward from the hind legs than in forward pulling. A lion springing through the air from a distance of six feet would knock down a horse or bullock with a single blow of his forearm, backed by the momentum of his three hundred pounds weight, and a full-grown lion in the jungles would jump twenty-five or thirty feet on the level from a running start. In captivity the same lion would clear a distance about half as great. A lion can jump over a fence eight or ten feet high, but not at a bound. He catches first with his forelegs and drags his body after him. Tigers will jump a trifle higher than lions, but of all wild animals the leopards are the greatest jumpers, being able to hurl their lithe and beautiful bodies curled up almost into a ball to extraordinary heights. They bound with ease, for instance, from the floor of a cage so as to touch a ceiling twelve feet high. For a short distance a lion or tiger will outrun a man, and can equal the speed of a fast horse, but they lose their wind at the end of half a mile at the most. They have little endurance and are remarkably weak in lung power. Their strength is the kind which is capable of a terrific effort for a short time. It would take six men, for instance, to hold a lion down in his first struggles, even after his legs were tied. One day Philadelphia, wishing to test the affection popularly supposed to exist between a lion and a mouse, put a mouse in the cage of a full-grown Nubian lion. The lion saw the mouse before it was fairly through the bars, and was after him instantly. Away went the little fellow, scurrying across the floor and squealing in fright. When he had gone about ten feet, the lion sprang, lighting a little in front of him. The mouse turned, and the lion sprang again. This was repeated several times, the mouse traversing a shorter distance after each spring of the lion. It was demonstrated that a lion is too quick for a mouse, at least in a large cage. Finally the mouse stood still, trembling, while the lion studied it with interest. Presently he shot out his big paw, and brought it down directly on the mouse, but so gently that the little fellow was not injured in the least, though held fast between the claws. Then the lion played with him in the most extraordinary way, now lifting his paw and letting the mouse run a few inches, now stopping him as before. Suddenly the mouse changed his tactics, and instead of running when the lion lifted his paw, sprang into the air straight at the lion's head. The lion, terrified, gave a great lead back, striking the bars with all his weight and shaking the whole floor. Then he opened his great jaws and roared and roared again, while the little mouse, still squealing, made his escape. Of the two, the lion was the more frightened. Speaking of Philadelphia, I used to wonder, as I watched him manage Black Prince on horseback, whether the lion was really in earnest as he struck and roared with such apparent viciousness, or whether he had simply been trained to play a part. Certainly the lion looked as if his one desire was to kill the little man who teased him so with rod and whip, 
smiling all the time under his yellow moustache. One night Black Prince sprang ten feet through the air straight at Philadelphia, who saved his life by dodging, but did not escape the sweep of the lion's forearm. No one knew that, however, for the tamer showed no sign of injury, but brought his heavy whip down with a stinging cut over the lion's head, and went through the act, holding a handkerchief to his face now and then, but smiling as before. When he left the ring it was found that one of the lion's claws had laid his cheek open almost from eye to lip. "'He meant to kill me that trip,' said Philadelphia, as they bound up his face. "'We will never show that lion again,' declared the manager, much excited. "'Oh, yes, we will,' answered the wounded tamer. "'I will make him work tomorrow as usual.' And he did, teasing and prodding him that day as never before, as if daring him to do his worst. The climax was reached one night in January, when Black Prince came within an ace of killing this daring tamer, and certainly would have done so had not his attention been diverted just at the critical moment by the horse he was riding. He paused in the very act of springing, as if undecided whether to destroy the man or the horse, and that pause put the tamer on his guard, while the watchful grooms rushed in through the iron gates and drove Black Prince from the ring. Speaking to me afterward of that night, Philadelphia said, I knew the critical moment had come, and it would not do to push matters any further. If I had made Black Prince do his jump when he balked and turned on me, he would have sprung at my throat, caught me between his forepaws, and fastened his fangs in my neck or breast. It would have been impossible for ten men to have dragged him off, and I should have been killed there in the sight of all the spectators just as my nephew, Albert Crone, was killed in Germany some years ago by a Russian bear. In conclusion, let me recall the night that I spent among the wild beasts of the famous Hagenberg Menagerie. That, by the way, is a thing worth doing if one values strange sensations. It is two hours after midnight. The snow lies crisp underfoot, the stars and electric lights shine quietly in the still night. Before me rises a big building, its walls pictured with springing lions and pyramids of tigers. As I enter, a long roar from within tells me that the animals are not all asleep. The roar, a lion's, comes three times with increasing volume, and at the fourth is answered by another of equal volume. Then two lions roar together, the sounds coming quicker and quicker, with an increasing staccato that ends finally in hoarse sparks. Taking a little alarm clock that the night watchman loans me, I go back among the cages, where I am to keep strange vigil. A small wooden door at the right takes me into an open space ranged with cages and wagons, the former containing some barking dogs. From here I pass into a circular shed where there are more wagons and dogs, and at the farther end, by the wet, sticky-looking seals, I reach a small door leading into a low passage, beyond which are the wild beasts. I push aside a curtain covering the entrance against draughts, and see before me a picture never dreamed of by humdrum New Yorkers sleeping within stone's throw. The cages, ranged in double row, form an alleyway, divided at intervals by gas stoves, on which water is heating. In front of a big group of lions and tigers sleeps one of the grooms, stretched out on a cot bed. He wears a pink shirt and blue drawers, and his bare feet are turned to the gas stove, which burns night and day. Another groom sleeps further on, beside the Tibet goats and still another near the ponies, opposite the small cage of the lioness Mignon. They sleep so soundly that a riot would scarcely waken them, yet by some subtle sense they would be on the alert in an instant if anything were wrong in the cages. Three animals rouse themselves as I step into the darkness which shrouds the big cage. The lion yellow prince is one of them and as I approach the bars, three pairs of burning eyes glare at me through the shadows. I venture to turn on the electric light and peer into the cage. Here are three leopards, the three royal Bengal tigers, and a full-grown lion, making no more noise between them than a sleeping child. I return to the farther end of the shed, 
where the five-year-old lioness Helena, alone in her cage, is walking back and forth drowsily, as if on the point of dropping off for her night's rest. Indeed, she does this presently, turning on her side and stretching her legs out perfectly straight, with no bend at the joints. It was Helena who, in a fit of nervous fright a year or so ago, sprang upon Betty Stuckett, the famous prize beauty, and nearly killed her. Since then she has lived in solitary confinement. The stillness now would be absolute, but for a very curious sound, which comes out of the gloom beyond the big cage of leopards and tigers. It is the elephant Topsy sleeping. There is no stranger sight in the menagerie than an of elephants asleep. The huge legs are bent to right angles at the knees, the trunk is curled into the mouth, and the whole suggests a shapeless mound of mud or clay, or a half-inflated balloon. Head and tail are alike, the ears lie flat, the eyes are quite concealed in wrinkled flesh, but from somewhere within this seemingly dead mass comes a long hissing sound, like the exhaust from a steam pipe. This sound continues for several seconds, and then stops to be repeated after an interval of silence. So complete is the illusion of the sleeping elephants not being alive at all, but only a mound of dead matter, that abstractly I set the alarm clock down upon the flat bone of the forehead. No sooner have I done so than I spring back startled, leaving the clock ticking on the elephant's head. There has been no noise or movement, no indication of this pleasure, no effort to do me harm. But suddenly, in the middle of the huge mud-coloured mass, there has appeared a round red circle about two inches in diameter. The elephant has simply opened his eye. The eye does not roll or move or wink. It merely remains open on me for a few seconds, a round, stirring circle, and then disappears as suddenly as it came. Leaving Topsy, I resume my wanderings among the cages. The whole place is asleep, and I am seized with intense desire to awaken something. I take a long straw and tickle Black Prince on his black nose. His eyes open instantly, and the heavy paw swings round like the working beam of an engine, only more quickly to crush the straw for its impertinence. I tickle him again, and again he strikes with force enough to knock down a horse. As I continue, his blows grow quicker and heavier and his big tusks snap at the troublesome straw. Finally, in desperation, he starts up, and throwing back his magnificent head, looks at me out of his brown wicked eyes, lifts his chin, curls down his lower lip a little, and bellows forth a low plaintive sound, more like the mooing of a cow than the roar of a lion. Then, apparently ashamed of this uninspiring sound, he shakes his mane and roars in genuine lion fashion. So the hours of the night pass, and at last, having seen everything and grown weary of experiments, I seat myself on a trunk near Black Prince's cage, and am soon buried in my meditations. The tips of the tiger's noses begin to change from red to green and then back again. The leopard's tails are no longer straight, but end in snake heads with forked tongues darking out. I overhear curious conversations among the lions, and presently men in blue shirts and pink drawers come marching past, each carrying an alarm clock. Then a curious thing happens. With a sweep of her trunk, the elephant Topsy lifts Jocko the monkey out of his red box. You must unlock the cages, says Topsy. All right, says Jocko, and he does. Then all the lions, tigers, leopards, boarhounds, Tibet goats, bears, ponies, and wild boars join in the procession, while the alarm clock beats time. Black Prince walks first, and presently wheeling the lion towards me, lifts his forepaw and says, Mine hair, it is six o'clock. End of The Wild Beast Tamer The Dynamite Worker, Part 1 of Careers of Danger and Daring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Dynamite Worker, Part One. The Story of Some Millionaire Heroes and the World's Greatest Powder Explosion. There is illustrated in this career of the explosive maker a splendid fact touching courage that, once a man has begun to practice it, the habit holds him with stronger and stronger grip, so that he must be brave whether he will or no. I think of firemen, for instance, who for years had jumped at the tap of a bell into any peril, would show the same fine courage all alone, let us say, in some crisis on a desert island. He couldn't turn coward if he tried. It is good to know, too, that these fearless qualities may be transmitted from father to son, so that we have whole families born, as it were, to be brave, and we see the son of a pilot facing the seasick torture for twenty-odd years, as his father faced it before him for thirty. Nor is it possible to be in close relations with a very brave man, without yielding in some measure to his personality. Heroes produce heroes through a sort of neighborhood influence, just as surely as thieves produce their kind. Thus the brother-in-law of a lion-tamer, though previously a mild enough man, takes to taming lions, and does it well. And wives of acrobats find themselves one day quietly facing perils of the air, that would surely have blanched their cheeks had they married, let us say, photographers. All of which brings me to a remarkable family of explosive makers, the DuPonts of Wilmington, who for generations now have had practical monopoly in this country of the powder-making business, including dynamite and nitroglycerin. In this enterprise a great fortune has accumulated, so that the DuPonts of today are very rich men, far beyond any need of working in the mills themselves, and have been for years. Yet work in the mills they do, all of them practically, and direct in detail every process of manufacture, and face continually in their own persons the same terrible dangers that the humblest mixer faces. There has grown in their hearts through the century, along with riches, a great pride of courage, like that of the officer who leads his men into battle, a pride far stronger than any longing for idleness or pleasure. And they cannot, if they would, leave these slow-grinding mills, where any day a spark may bring catastrophe to make the whole land shudder, as it has shuddered many times after the fury of these giant magazines. There came a day, for instance, this was a long time ago, when a swift flame swept through one of the mixing-rooms, nearly empty of powder at the time, yet so permeated with the stuff in floor and walls that instantly the building was burning fiercely. No man can say what started it. The cause of trouble at a powder mill is seldom known. It comes too quickly, and usually leaves no witness. A nail overlooked in a workman's heel may have done the harm by striking a stone, though of course there is an imperative rule that all footgear made with nails be left outside the walls, or a heavy box slid along the wooden floor may have brought a flash out of the dry timbers. At any rate, the flash came, and the blaze followed on it so swiftly that the building was wrapped in fire before men inside could reach the door, and they presently burst out blazing themselves, for their clothing, as it must be, was sifted through with explosive dust. Indeed, it is always true in fires at powder mills that the workmen themselves are a serious menace to the buildings by reason of their own inflammability. So the next thing was a plunge into the placid brandywine, which winds across the yards between willow-hung banks. In went the men, in went young Alexis Dupont, and with a little hiss their flaming garments were extinguished. Then, as they struck out into the stream, they looked back, and saw that the wind was carrying a shower of sparks from the burning building to the roof of a cutting mill nearby, where tons of powder lay. For one of the sparks to reach the tiniest powder train would mean the blowing up of this mill, and almost certainly the blowing up of another and another by the concussion, 
for it is in vain that they try to protect powder mills by scattering them over wide yards in many little buildings. When one explodes, the great shock usually sets off others, as a falling rock turns loose an avalanche. All this young Dupont realized in a single glance. There would be an awful disaster presently, with many lives imperiled, unless those falling firebrands could somehow be kept off that roof. To know this was to act. Millionaire or not, peril or not, it was his plain duty as a Dupont to fight those sparks, and without a moment's wavering he turned back and scrambled up the bank. "'Come on, boys,' he cried. "'Start the bucket line.' And a moment later he was climbing to the roof of the threatened mill, where he did all that a brave man can do, stamped out the falling embers, dashed water again and again upon the kindling fire as the men passed up full buckets, and for a time seemed to conquer. But presently the fire flamed hotter, the sparks came faster, and the water came not fast enough. He saw, he must have seen, that the struggle was hopeless, that the mill beneath him was doomed, that the explosion must come soon. From the ground they shouted, calling on him to save himself. He shouted back in order that they must pass up more water, and keep passing water. There was only one thing in the world he wanted, water. The men below did their best, but it was a vain effort, for in those days the roofs of powder mills were made of pitch and cement, not of iron as today, and by this time the fire had eaten its way nearly through. Alexis Dupont, working desperately, stood there with flames spreading all around him. It was plain to everyone that the minutes of his life were numbered. Again they shouted, and— the explosion came like an execution, and out of the wreck of it they bore away his crushed and broken body. The last thing he knew was that he had played the game out fairly to the end. He died like a Dupont, said the men. Such was the spirit of the second generation. Alexis Dupont was a son of old Elether, founder of the line. And later we find the same courage in the third generation, as on March 29, 1884, when Lamotte Dupont, one of the grandchildren, took his stand inside the dynamite mill, his mill, when it was threatened by fire, and stayed there after every man had left it, struggling with hand and brain against the danger, until the explosion, coming like a thousand cannon, crashed his body deep into a sand heap, and left it with the life gone out. I suppose this is only an instance of nature's tendency to furnish always what is needed, to raise up a hero for each emergency. But it is encouraging to know that the very finest kind of courage may be thus developed by the mere pressure of moral responsibility in a man under no master, but free to be a craven if he will. We have seen something like this in the splendid devotion of fire department chiefs, who often outshine all their men simply because they cannot resist the gallant spirit in their own hearts. Now for the exception to this rule of persisting courage, an exception sometimes presented in the lives of explosive makers, and in the other lives too, and showing that in certain cases courage may suddenly and strangely disappear. A man may be brave for years, and then cease to be brave. The wild beast tamer may awaken some morning, and discover himself afraid of his lions. The steeple-climber who has never flinched at any height may shrink at last. The pilot in the rapids, the acrobat on his swing, the diver sinking to a wreck, may feel a quaking of heart unknown before. Here is apparent contradiction, for how can courage be made by habit, and then unmade? I don't know. I merely give the facts, as I have found them, and it is quite certain that a sturdy Irishman, who has shoveled powder all his life, and waded in it knee-deep, as if it were so much coal-dust, may, for no reason he can put finger on, find himself lying awake of nights, reflecting on what would happen if a spark should strike under one of the big rollers he feeds so carelessly, or, remembering uneasily that dream of his wife's about a white horse, 
every powder man knows the close relation between dreams and explosions, and, well, they will all tell you this, that the only thing for a man to do when his heart feels the cold touch of fear is to quit his job. If he doesn't, his knell is sounded, he is marked for sacrifice, his tigers will rend him, the deep waters will overwhelm him, a swift fall will crush him, he will surely die. The greatest catastrophe in the records of powder-making came because a man ignored such plain warning of his own fear. At least the workmen at the DuPont mills will tell you this, if you can get them to break through their usual reserve. The man was William Green, and, whatever his fault, he paid the fullest price for it. Green was stationed in one of the magazines, with the responsibility of sealing up hexagonal powder, a very powerful kind used by the government in heavy guns. This powder comes pressed into little six-sided cakes of reddish colour, which are packed in large wooden boxes lined with tin, and it was Green's duty to solder the tin covers tight with a hot iron. In each box there was enough of this powder to blow up a fortress, and it is no wonder the occupation finally told on Green's nerves. He said to his wife that, sooner or later, a speck of grit would touch his iron and make a spark, and then— The theory is that a spark is required to explode powder, which will only burn harmlessly at the touch of a hot iron or flame. However this may be, and I should add that the theory is disputed, Green felt that he was in danger, and by that fact, say the powder men, if for no other reason, he was in danger. And one day, it was October 7, 1890, the spark came. Surely that was a most important spark, for it caused the explosion of one hundred and fifty tons of gunpowder, the instant death of thirteen men and one woman, and the serious or fatal injury of twenty-two men and nine women. Only an earthquake could have wrought such terrible destruction. The city of Wilmington was shaken to its foundations. Great chasms were rent in the solid rock under the exploding magazines. Trees were torn up by the roots. Iron castings, weighing tons, were hurled clean across the brandywine. Iron columns, thick as a man's waist, were twisted and bent like copper wire. Horses outside the yards were found with legs missing. Men were found stripped clean of their clothes, and this curious fact was developed that a man or a horse in the region of explosion would have shoes blown from the feet, iron shoes or leather shoes, if the legs were on the ground at the moment of shock, but would keep shoes on if the legs were lifted. Thus poor Green was found with both feet shod, and so identified, although his body had no other stitch of covering, and the explanation was that he probably saw the spark in time to spring away, and was actually in the air when the explosion came. In my investigations I have heard various stories showing what uncertainty there is as to the behavior of dynamite in the presence of fire. Workmen who handle it constantly in blasting operations say you can put fire to a stick of dynamite without danger, and it will simply burn away in bluish flame. On the other hand, they admit that in every fifty or a hundred sticks there may be one where the touch of fire will bring explosion. It is quite certain that this was the case in New York's recent tunnel accident near 180th Street, and I have some facts of interest here obtained from a workman who was in the main gallery at the time. This man heard a shout of warning, and, looking down the rock street, saw a puddle of blazing oil from one of the lamps lapping at the side of a heavy wooden box. He knew that the box was full of dynamite, and as he looked he saw the yellow oil flame turn to blue. That was enough for him, and he started to run for his life. But the explosion caught him in the first step, lifted him from the ground, and bore him on, while his legs kept up the motions of running. He was running on the air. As he was thus hurled along, his knee struck a large stone between the siding and the north heading, and he fell on his face, half-dazed. 
The air was thick with strangling fumes. There was a frightful din about him, yells and crashing stones. Every lamp had been blown out, and in the utter darkness he could see the glaring eyeballs of fleeing negroes who cursed in awful oaths as they ran. He pressed his mouth close to the ground, and found he could breathe better. He felt someone step over him and seized a leg. The leg kicked itself free and went on. He groped about with his hands and touched an iron rail. It was the little track for hauling the dumping cars. He crept along this painfully to the siding, then down the siding to the shaft, where, in the blackness, he found a frantic company. Negroes mad with fright, Italians screaming and praying, Irishmen keeping fairly cool, but wondering why, oh, why, the elevator did not come and several men stretched on the ground quite still, or groaning quietly. Time lacks for the rest of the story. They took out men dressed in a collar and shirt-band only, everything else blown off, and some whose faces were mottled with fragments of stone, a kind of dynamite tattooing, and some grievously injured. There are no limits to the fury of dynamite. Once it sets out, to be cruel. End of section twenty nine. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, in November two thousand ten in San Diego, California. The Dynamite Worker, Part Two. Of Careers of Danger and Daring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Dynamite Worker. Part 2. We visit a dynamite factory and meet a man who thinks courage is an accident. On a certain pleasant morning in June, I set forth to visit a dynamite factory, and see with my own eyes, if might be, some of the men who follow this strange and hazardous business. As the train rushed along, I thought of the power for good and evil that is in this wonderful agent. Dynamite piercing mountains. Dynamite threatening armies and blowing up great ships. A teacup full of dynamite shattering a fortress. A teaspoonful of the essence of dynamite that is, nitroglycerin, tearing a man to atoms. What kind of fellows must they be who spend their lives making dynamite? In due course I found myself back in the hill land of northern New Jersey, where everything is green and quiet, a lovely summer's retreat with nothing in external signs to suggest an industry of violence. Stop. Here is a sign, though it doesn't seem much. Two sleepy wagons lumbering along the road between these cool woods and the waving fields. Farm produce? Lumber? No. The first is loaded with a sort of yellow meal, and trails the way with yellow sprinklings. That is sulphur. They use it at the works. The second is piled up with crates, out of which come thick glass necks, like the heads of imprisoned turkeys. These are carboys of nitric acid, hundreds of gallons of that terrible stuff, which is so truly liquid fire, that a single drop of it on a piece of board will set the wood in flames. This nitric acid mixed with innocent sweet glycerin, it comes along the road in barrels, makes nitroglycerin, and the proper mixing of these two is the chief business of a dynamite factory. Farther down the road I came to a railroad track where a long freight train was standing on a siding. Some men were busy here loading a car with clean-looking wooden boxes that might have held starch or soap, but did hold dynamite, neatly packed in long, fat sticks like huge firecrackers. Each box bore this inscription in red letters, HIGH EXPLOSIVES, DANGEROUS. I looked along the train and saw that there were several cars closed and sealed, with a sign nailed on the outside. Powder. Handle carefully. In this case, powder means dynamite, for the product of a dynamite factory is always called powder. 
I think the men feel more comfortable when they use that milder name. There was powder enough on this train to wreck a city, but nobody seemed to mind. The horses switched their tails. The men laughed and loitered. They might have been laying bricks, for any interest they showed. I asked one of them if it is considered safe to haul carloads of dynamite about the country. He said that some people consider it safe, and some do not. Some railroads will carry dynamite, while others refuse it. "'Suppose a man were to shoot a rifle-ball into one of these cars?' I asked. "'Do you think it would explode?' This led to an argument. One of the group was positive it would explode. Concussion, he declared, is the thing that sets off dynamite. Another knew of experiments at the works where they had fired rifle-balls into quantities of dynamite, and found that sometimes it exploded and sometimes it didn't. Then a third man spoke up with an air of authority. "'You've got to have a red spark,' said he, "'to set off dynamite. I've handled it long enough to know. Here's an experiment that's been tried. They took an old flat car and loaded it with rocks. Then they fastened a box of dynamite to the bumper and let the car run down a steep grade, bang, into another car anchored at the bottom.' and they found that the dynamite never exploded unless the bumpers were faced with iron. It didn't matter how much concussion they'd got with wooden bumpers, the dynamite was like that much putty. But as soon as a red spark jumped into it out of the iron, why, off she'd go. Then he instanced various cases where powder cars had gone through railroad wrecks without exploding, although boxes of dynamite had been smashed open and scattered about. "'How about that car of ours the other day up in central New York?' said the first man. "'Everything blown to pieces, and six lads killed.' He smiled grimly, but the other persisted. "'That collision only proves what I say. There was a red-hot locomotive ploughing through a car of dynamite, and of course she went up. But it wasn't the concussion that did it. It was the sparks.' "'You say that it takes a red spark,' I observed, to set off dynamite, "'Do you mean that a white spark wouldn't do it?' "'That's what I mean,' said he. "'It seems queer, but it's a fact. "'Put a white-hot poker into a box of dynamite, and it will only burn. "'But let the poker cool down until it's only red-hot, and the dynamite will explode.' "'Pondering this remarkable statement, I continued on my way, "'and presently, not seeing any big building, "'asked a farmer where the Atlantic dynamite works were.' He swept the horizon with his arm, and said they were all about us. They covered hundreds of acres, little, low buildings placed far apart, so that if one exploded it wouldn't set off the rest. "'The dynamite magazines are along the hillside yonder,' he said. "'If they went up, I guess there wouldn't be much left of the town.' "'What town?' said I. "'Why, Kenville. That's where the dynamite mixers live. It's over there. Quickest way is across this field and over the fence.' I followed his advice, and presently passed near a number of small brick buildings, so very innocent-looking, that I found myself saying, "'What, this blow up? Or that little sputtering shanty-town a wreck?' It seemed ridiculous. I learned afterward that I had walked through the most dangerous part of the works. It isn't size here that counts. I paused at several open doors, and got a whiff of chemicals that made me understand the dynamite sickness— of which I had heard. No man can breathe the strangling fumes of nitric acid and nitrated glycerin without discomfort, and every man here must breathe them. They rise from vats and troughs like brownish-yellow smoke. They are in the mixing-rooms, in the packing-rooms, in the freezing-house, in the separating-house, everywhere, and they take men in the throat and make their hearts pound strangely and set their heads splitting with pain." Not a workman escapes the dynamite headache. New hands are wretched with it for a fortnight, and even the well-seasoned men get a touch of it on Monday mornings, after the Sunday rest. In walking about the works I noticed that the several buildings, representing different steps in the manufacture of explosives, are united by long troughs or pipes, sufficiently inclined to allow the nitroglycerin to flow by its own weight from one building to another so that you watch the first operations in dynamite-making at the top of a slope, and the last ones at the bottom. 
of course this transportation by flow is possible for nitroglycerin only while it is a liquid, and not after it has been absorbed by porous earth, and given the name of dynamite, and the look of moist sawdust. As dynamite it is transported between buildings on little railroads, with horses to haul the cars. I noted also that most of the buildings are built against a hillside, or surrounded by heavy mounds of earth, so that if one of them blows up, the others may be protected against the flight of debris. Without such barricade the shattered walls and rocks would be hurled in all directions, with the energy of cannonballs, and a single explosion would probably mean the destruction of the entire works. At one place I saw a triangular frame of timbers and iron supporting a five-hundred-pound swinging mortar that hung down like a great gypsy kettle under its tripod. In front of this mortar was a sand heap, and here, I learned, were made the tests of dynamite, a certain quantity of this lot or that being exploded against the sand heap, and the mortars swing back from the recoil giving a measure of its force. The more nitroglycerin there is in a given lot of dynamite, the farther back the mortar will swing. It should be understood that there are many different grades of dynamite, the strength of these depending upon how much nitroglycerin has been absorbed by a certain kind of porous earth. In a little white house beyond the laboratory I found the superintendent of the works, a man of few words, accustomed to give brief orders and have them obeyed. He did not care to talk about dynamite. They never do. He did not think there was much to say, anyhow, except that people have silly notions about the danger. He had been working with dynamite now for twenty-five years, and never had an accident, that is, himself. Oh, yes, some men had been killed in his time, but not so many as in other occupations, not nearly so many as in railroading. Of course there was danger in dealing with any great force. The thing would run away with you now and then, but on the whole he regarded dynamite as a very well-behaved commodity, and much slandered. "'Then you think dynamite workers have no great need of courage?' I suggested. "'No more than others. Why should they? They work along for years, and nothing happens. They might as well be shoveling coal. And if anything does happen, it's over so quick that courage isn't much use.' Having said this, he hesitated a moment, and then, as if in a spirit of fairness, told of a certain man at the head of a nitroglycerin mill, who on one occasion did do a little thing that some people called brave. He wouldn't give the name of this certain man, but I fancied I could guess it. This nitroglycerin mill, it seems, was on the Pacific coast, whence they used to ship the dynamite on vessels that loaded right alongside the yards. One day a mixing-house exploded, and hurled burning timbers over a vessel lying near that had just received a fresh cargo. Her decks were piled with boxes of explosives, wooden boxes, which at once took fire. When this certain man rushed down to the dock, the situation was as bad as could be. There were tons of dynamite ready to explode, and a hot fire was eating deeper into the wood with every second and all the workmen had run for their lives. "'Well,' said the superintendent, "'what this man did was to grab a bucket and line, and jump on the deck. Yes, it was burning, everything was burning. But he went to work lowering the bucket overside, and throwing water on the flaming boxes. After a while he put them out, and the dynamite didn't explode at all. But it would have exploded in a mighty short time if he had kept away, for the wood was about burned through in several places.' I know that's a true story, because, well, because I know it. Don't you call that man brave? I asked. The superintendent shook his head. He was brave in that particular instance, but he might not have been brave at another time. You never can tell what a man will do in danger. It depends on how he feels, or on how a thing happens to strike him. A man might act like a hero one day, and like a coward another day, with exactly the same danger in both cases. There's a lot of chance in it. If that man I'm telling you about had been up late the night before, or had eaten a tough piece of steak for breakfast, the chances are he would have run like the rest. End of section 30. Read by Kara Schallenberg, 
www.kray.org in November 2010 in San Diego, California. The Dynamite Worker, Part 3, of Careers of Danger and Daring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Dynamite Worker, Part 3. How Joshua Plumstead stuck to his nitroglycerin vat in an explosion and saved the works. I drove over from the works to Kenville, under the escort of a red-nosed man who discoursed on local matters, particularly on the prospects of his youngest son, who was eighteen years old, and earned three dollars a day. "'What does he do?' I asked. "'He's a packer,' said the red-nosed man. "'What does he pack?' "'Dynamite. Guess there ain't no other stuff he could pack and get them wages. Just the same, I wish he'd quit, especially since the big blow-up t'other day.' "'Why, what blew up?' I inquired. "'Freezing House did, with an all-fired big lot of nitroglycerin. "'Nobody knows what set her off. "'Regular miracle, there weren't a lot killed. "'Man in charge, feller named Ball, he went out to look at a water pipe. "'Hadn't been out the door a minute when off she went. "'Say, you'd oughter seen the boys run. "'They tell me some of them jumped clean through the winders, sashes and all. "'If you want to know more about it, there's my boy now. "'He was right near the house when it happened.' We drew up at the Kenville Hotel, where a young man was sitting. Here was the modern dynamite worker, and not at all as I had pictured him. He looked like a summer boarder, who liked to take things easy, and wear good clothes. Wondering much, I sat down and talked to this young man, a skillful dynamite packer, it appears, who happened at the time to be taking a day off. "'They put me at machine-packing a few days ago,' he said, "'and it's made my wrist lame.' going to rest until Monday. After some preliminaries I asked him about the process of packing dynamite, and he explained how the freshly mixed explosive is delivered at the various packing houses in little tubs, a hundred pounds to a tub, and how they dig into it with shovels and mould it into shape on the benches like so much butter, and ram it into funnels, and finally, with the busy tamping of rubber-shod sticks, "'squeeze it down into the paper shells that form the cartridges. "'One would say they play with concentrated death, "'as children play with sawdust dolls, "'but he declared it safe enough. "'How large are the cartridges?' I asked. "'Oh, different sizes. "'The smallest are about eight inches long, "'and the largest thirty. "'And they vary from one inch thick up to two and a half. I know a man who carried a thirty-inch cartridge all the way to Morristown in an ordinary passenger car. He had it wrapped in a newspaper, under his arm, like a big loaf of bread. But say, he took chances all right. At this another man informed us that people often carry nitroglycerin about with them, and take no risk, by simply pouring it into a big bottle of alcohol. Then it can do no harm, and when they want to use the explosive— they have only to evaporate the alcohol. The talk turned to precautions taken against accidents. In all powder mills the workmen are required to change their clothes before entering the buildings, and to put on rubber-soled shoes. There must be no bit of metal about a man's person, no iron nail or buckle, nothing that could strike fire. And of course the workman who would bring a match on the premises would be counted worse than an assassin. "'Just the same, though. Matches get into the works once in a while,' remarked the young packer. "'I found a piece of a match one day in a tub of dynamite. It had the head on, too. "'Say, it's bad enough to find buttons and pebbles, but when I saw that match head, well, it made me weak in the knees.' "'This brought back the old question, when does dynamite explode, and when does it not explode?' "'I mentioned the red spark theory.' "'I think that's correct,' agreed the packer. "'I've watched em burn old dynamite boxes, "'and if there are iron nails in the boxes, "'they explode as soon as the nails get red hot. "'If there are no nails, they don't explode.' "'You mean empty boxes?' I asked. "'Certainly. 
but there's nitroglycerin in the wood, lots of it. It oozes out of the dynamite, especially on a hot day, and soaks into everything. Why, I suppose there's enough nitroglycerin in the overalls I wear to blow a man into— well, I wouldn't want to lay him on an anvil and give him a whack with a sledge. There was a certain novelty to me in the thought of a pair of old overalls exploding, but I was soon to hear of stranger things. By this time other workmen had drawn up chairs, and were ready now with modest contributions from their own experience. "'Tell you a queer thing,' said one man. "'In that explosion the other day—I mean the freezing-house— a car loaded with powder, dynamite, had just passed, not a minute before the explosion. Lucky for the three men with the car, wasn't it? But what gets me is how the blast, when it came, blew the harness off the horse. Yes, sir, that's what it did, clean off, and away he went, galloping after the men as hard as he could leg it. Nobody touched a buckle or a strap. It was dynamite unhitched that animal." "'Dynamite did another trick that day,' put in a tall man. "'It caught a bird on the wing. "'Dunno whether twas a robin or a swaller, but twas a bird all right. "'Caught it in a sheet of tin blowed off the roof, "'and just twisted that little bird all up as it sailed along. "'And when it struck the ground, there was the bird fast in a cage, "'made in the air out of a tin roof. "'Alive? Yes, sir, alive. "'And that shows how fast dynamite does business.' So the talk ran on, with many little details of explosions. The expert explained that the air waves of a great concussion move along with crests and troughs like water waves, and the shattering effect comes only at the crests, so that all the windows might be broken in a house, say, half a mile from an explosion, and no windows be broken in a house two hundred yards nearer. The first house would have been smitten by a destructive wave crest, the second passed over by a harmless wave trough. And, by the way, when windows are broken by these blasts of concussion, it appears that they are usually broken outward, not inward, and that the fragments are found on the ground outside the house, not on the floors inside. The reason of this is that the concussion waves leave behind them a partial vacuum, and windows are broken by the air inside houses rushing out. "'How about thunderstorms?' I asked. "'There is always danger,' said the expert, "'and all hands hurry out of the works "'as soon as the lightning begins to play. "'If a bolt struck a lot of dynamite, "'it would set it off.' "'Then he explained that the policy of dynamite manufacturers "'is to handle explosives in small quantities, "'say a ton at a time, "'each lot being finished and hauled away in wagons "'before another lot is started.' This is possible because of the short time occupied in making dynamite. He assured me, for instance, that if there were only raw materials at the works on a certain morning, when the seven o'clock whistle blew, it would be perfectly possible to have a ton of dynamite cartridges finished, packed in boxes, and loaded on freight cars by nine o'clock. After this someone told of a thrilling happening in the mixing-house, by the great vat, wherein nitroglycerin is mixed with porous earth, called dope, and becomes dynamite. Over this vat four men work continually, two with rakes, two with hose, kneading half a ton or more of explosive dough to the proper consistency. One day a powder car loaded with heavy stone got loose on its track a quarter of a mile up the slope, and started down the steep grade. The tracks ran straight into the mixing-house. The switch was open, and the first thing these men knew there was an angry clang at the switch, and then a swift heavy car was plunging toward the open door, with every chance that it would set off twelve hundred pounds of dynamite there. Workmen outside shouted, and then stared in horror. Not a man in the mixing-house moved. All four kept their places around the vat, held tight to their rakes and hose, while the car, just missing the dynamite, "'hurled its mass of two tons through the back wall of the building "'and spent its force against a tree-trunk. "'There was no explosion, and nothing happened, "'which was something of a miracle. "'But what impressed me was that these four men stood still, "'not from courage, but because they were frozen with fear. 
while there is danger in every step of dynamite manufacture, it appears that the centre of peril is in the nitrating house, where the fresh glycerin is mixed with nitric acid, or, more correctly, is nitrated by it. This operation takes place in a great covered vat, about which are many pipes and cockstops. A man stands here like an engineer at the throttle, watching his thermometer and letting in fresh glycerin. These are his two duties, and upon the right performance of them depends the safety of the works. Every hour he must let in some seven hundred pounds of glycerin upon the deadly acid, and every hour he must draw off some fifteen hundred pounds of nitroglycerin and let it go splashing away in a yellowish stream down the long, uncovered trough that leads to the separating house yonder. From this separating house runs another trough to the freezing house, and a third to the distant mixing house. These three troughs enclose an oblong space, at the corners of which stand the nitrating house, the separating house, and the freezing house. In each one of these, at any hour of the day, is a wagon load of pure nitroglycerin, while in the three troughs are little rivers of nitroglycerin always flowing. The arrangement of buildings in this part of the works makes clearer what was done at the nitrating house by a certain Joshua Plumstead in the recent explosion. Joshua is a veteran at dynamite making. He has worked at the nitrating vat for twenty-five years, and has probably made more nitroglycerin than any one man in the world. He has been through all the great explosions. He has seen many men killed. He has stood by time and again when his own nitrating vat has taken fire, and yet he always comes through safely. They say there is no man like Joshua for nerve and judgment when the demons of gas and fire begin to play. The explosion took place at the freezing house, which is the one place in all the works where dynamite is never expected to explode. Yet it did explode now, with a smashing of air, and a horrible grinding underfoot that stifled all things in men but a mad desire to flee. Joshua Plumstead was in the nitrating house alone. His helper had fled. The roof timbers were crashing down about him. He heard the hiss of fire and the shouts of workmen running. He knew that a second explosion might come at any moment. There was danger from firebrands and flying masses of stone and iron, danger from the open troughs, danger from the nearby houses. A shock, a spark anywhere here, might mean the end. Plumstead kept his eyes on the long thermometer that reached up from the furious smoking mass of oil and acid. The mercury had crept up from eighty-five to ninety, and was rising still. At ninety-five he knew the nitroglycerin would take fire, probably explode, and nothing could save it. The vat was seething with a full charge. Ninety-one. He shut off the inflow of glycerin. Ninety-two. Something might be wrong with the coils of ice-cold water that chill the vat down to safety. He opened the cocks full. Crash came a beam from overhead, and narrowly missed the gearing of the agitating blades. Were they to stop but for a single second, the nitroglycerin would explode. He eased the bearings, turned on compressed air, watched the thermometer, and waited. There was no other man but Plumstead who did wait that day. There was none but he whose waiting could avail anything. He had to fight it out alone with that ton of nitroglycerin, or run and let an explosion come far worse than the other. He fought it out, he waited, and he won. Gradually the thermometer dropped to eighty-five, to eighty, and the danger was past. But, well, even the superintendent admitted that Joshua did a rather fine thing here, while the workmen themselves and the people of Kenville shake their heads solemnly, and vow that he saved the works. End of the Dynamite Worker, Part 3 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org In November 2010 in San Diego, California
The Locomotive Engineer, Part 1 of Careers of Danger and Daring. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat. The Locomotive Engineer, Part 1 how it feels to ride at night on a locomotive going ninety miles an hour. It is 8.30 p.m., any night you please, and for miles through the yards of East Chicago lights are swinging, semaphore arms are moving, men in clicking signal towers are juggling with electric buttons and pneumatic levers, target lights on a hundred switches are changing from red to green, from green to red, everything is clear everything is all right the lake shore mail is coming with eighty tons of letters and papers in its pouches relays of engines and engineers have brought these messages this news of the world thus far on their journey up the hudson they have come and across the empire state and along the shores of lake michigan nearly a thousand miles in twenty-four hours which is not so bad although the hottest, maddest rush is yet to come. It is a fine thing to know the men who drive the engines on these trains. Just to see them is something, and to make them talk, if you can do it, is better business than interviewing most celebrities you have heard about. To this end I set out, one evening early in January, for the great roundhouse of the Northwestern Road that lies on the outskirts of Chicago. A strange place, surely, is this to one who approaches it unprepared, a place where yellow eyes glare out of deep shadows, where fire dragons rush at you with crunchings and snortings, where the air hisses and roars. It might be some demon menagerie there in the darkness. To this place of fears and pitfalls I came an hour or so before starting time, and here I found Dan White, one of the Northwestern Crackajacks, giving the last careful touches to Locomotive 908 before the night's hard run. In almost our first words, my heart was won by something White said. I had mentioned Frank Bullard of the Burlington Road, a rival by all rights, and immediately this bluff, broad-shouldered man exclaimed, Ah, he's a fine fellow, Bullard is, and he knows how to run an engine. White would fight Bullard at the throttle to any finish, but would speak only good words of him. "'Tell me,' said I, "'about the great run you made the other night.' From a dozen lips I had heard of White's tremendous dash from Chicago to Clinton, Iowa. "'Oh, it wasn't much. We had to make the time up, and we did it. Didn't we, Fred?' This to the fireman, who nodded in assent, but said nothing. "'You made a record, didn't you?' Well, we went 138 miles in 143 minutes. That included three stops and two slowdowns. I don't know as anybody has beat that much. By dint of questioning, I drew from this modest man some details of his achievement. The curve-bent stretch of 17 miles between Franklin Grove and Nelson they did in 14 minutes, and a part of this beyond Natchusa they took at an eighty-mile pace. They covered five miles between Clarence and Stanwood in three minutes and a half, and they made two miles beyond Denison at over one hundred miles an hour. As the mail rushed west, word was flashed ahead, and crowds gathered at the stations to cheer and marvel. There must have been five hundred people on the platform at Dixon, said White, telling the story, and they looked to me like a swarm of ants, just a black wriggling mass, and then they were gone. We came on to a bridge there after a big reverse curve with a downgrade, and I guess no one will ever know how fast we were going as we slammed her around one way and then slammed her around the other way. It was every bit of ninety miles an hour. You got all you wanted, didn't you, Fred? The fireman looked up, torch in hand, and remarked in a dry monotone, Going through Dixon, I said my prayers and hung on, stretched out flat. That's what I done. Fred and I, continued White, both got letters about the run from the superintendent. Here's mine if you like to read it. 
the pleasure of these two blackened men over this graciousness of the superintendent was a thing to see for such a bit of paper crumpled and smeared with oil i believe they would have taken the mississippi at a jump engine train and all superintendent's orders superintendent's praise there is the beginning and end of all things for them my first long ride on one of these splendid locomotives was with the burlington night mail no passengers five ninety pulling her and frank bullard at the throttle it is said that the baldwin locomotive works never turned out a faster engine than this five ninety the man must be a giant whose head will top her drivers and for all her seventy tons there is speed in every line of her she is a young engine too only four years old and bullard swears he will back her in the matter of getting over rails to do anything that steel and steam can do she's willing and gentle sir and easy running you'll see in a minute these words from bullard first-class engine driver of the c b and q a long loosely jointed man with the eye and build of a scout as he spoke they were coupling us to the mail cars in preparation for the start in overalls and sweater i had come with typewritten authority to make the run that night this was in the first week in january the second time bullard had drawn the throttle for burlington on the new fast schedule burlington lay off there in iowa on the mississippi with all the night and all the state of illinois between us now the train stands ready three mail cars and the engine not a stick besides no pullman comforts here no bunks for sleeping no man aboard who has the right to sleep everything is hustle and business already the mail clerks are swarming at the pouches like printers on a rush edition see those last bags swung in through the panel doors not even the president of the road may ride here without a permit from the government bullard takes up a red smoking torch and looks five ninety over he fills her cuffs and prods a two-foot oiler into her rods and bearings dan cleary the fireman looks out of his window on the left and chews complacently down the track beside him locomotive thirteen o nine backs up a first-class engine she but five ninety bulks over her as the king of a herd over some good ordinary working elephant as she stands here now purring through her black iron throat five ninety measures sixteen feet three inches from rails to stack top both engines blow out steam that rolls up in silver clouds to the electric lights bullard climbs up to his place at the right and a hiss of air tells that he is testing the brakes under each car sixteen iron shoes close against sixteen wheels and stay there down the length of the train goes the repairman with his kit and makes sure that every contact is right then pulls a rope four times at the rear whereupon four hissing signals answer in the cab bullard shuts off the air it's all there is to stop her with says he so we take no chances with it she's got high-speed brakes on her five ninety has one hundred and ten pounds to the inch twenty-four dan he adds and snaps his watch we start at thirty dan chews on bad wind tonight he says regular gale bullard nods i know it we're fifteen minutes late too make burlington on time got to you hit it up and i'll skin her twenty-six dan four minutes to wait two station officials come up with polite inquiries the thermometer is falling they say and we shall have it bitter cold over the plains they reach up with cordial handshakes i pull my cap down and take my stand behind bullard our side of the cab is quite cut off from the fireman's side by a swelling girth of boiler which leaves an alleyway at right and left wide enough for a man's body and no wider bullard and i are in the right-hand alleyway bullard's back and black cap just before me dan with his shovel is out on a shaky steel shelf behind that bridges the space between engine and tender that is where he works poor lad we are breathing coal dust and torch smoke and warm oil 
comes the signal, and instantly we are moving. Lights flash about us everywhere, green lights, white lights, red lights, a phantasmagoria of drugstore bottles. The tracks shine yellow far ahead. A steady pounding and jarring begins, and grows like the roar of battle. Our cab heaves with the tugging of a captive balloon. Our speed increases amazingly. We seem constantly on the point of running straight through blocks of houses, and escape only by sudden and disconcerting swayings around curves that all lead, one will vow, straight into black chasms under the dazzle. Whoever rides here for the first time feels that he is ticketed for sure destruction, understands that this plunging engine must necessarily go off the rails in two or three minutes, say five at the latest. For what guidance, he reasons, can any man get from a million crazy lights, and who that is human can avoid a snarl in such a tangle of bumping switches? I am free to confess, for my own part, that I found the first half hour of my ride on 590 absolutely terrifying. Thus, at breakneck speed, we come out of Chicago, all slow-going city ordinances to the contrary notwithstanding. We are chasing a transcontinental railroad schedule, and have fifteen minutes to make up. I breathe more freely as we get into open country. We are going like the wind, but the track is straighter and the darkness comfortable. I begin to notice things with better understanding. As the lurches come, I brace myself against the boiler side without fear of burning. That is something learned. I find out later that I owe this protection to a two-inch layer of asbestos. I catch a faint sound of the engine bell and discover, to my surprise, that it has been ringing from the start. Indeed, it rings without ceasing all the way to Burlington, the rope pulled by a steam-jerking contrivance, but the roar of the engine drowns it. Deep shadows enwrap the cab, all the deeper for the glare that flashes through them every minute or two, as Dan, back there on his iron shelf, stokes coal in at the red-hot door. Two faint lights burn for the gauges, a jumping water column in front, a pair of wavering needles on the boiler. These bullard watches coolly, and from time to time reaches back past me to turn the injector cock, whereupon steam hisses by my head. For the most part he is quite still, like an Indian pilot, head forward at the lookout window, right hand down by the air brake valve, left hand across the throttle lever, with only a second's jump to the reversing lever that rises up from the floor straight before him. As we race into towns and roar through them, he sounds the chime whistle, making its deep voice challenge the darkness. At curves he eases her with the brakes and for grades and level stretches and bridges he notches the throttle up or down as the need is. Watch his big, strong grip on the polished handles. Think of the hours he spends here all alone, this man who holds life and death in his quick, sure judgment. Now he catches the window frame and slides it open. A blast sweeps in like an arctic hurricane. Bullard leans out into the night and seems to listen. Try it, he cries, but his voice is faint. I put my head out and come into a rush of air billows that strangle like breakers. Greg's Hill, three miles long. Let her go soon. He closes the window. And now, as we clear the grade, begins a burst of speed that makes the rest of small account. Faster and faster we go, until the very iron seems alive and straining underneath us. I am tossed about in hard pitches. The glow of the furnace lights up continuously. There is no sense of fear any longer. It is too splendid what we are doing. Of course, it means instant death if anything breaks. Let the massive side rod that holds the two drivers snap, and a half-ton knife sweeping seventy miles an hour will slice off our cab, and take us with it like a cut of cheese. Did not an engineer go to his death that way only last week on the Union Pacific run? After all, why not this death as well as any other? 
have we not valves and tubes in our bodies that may snap at any moment how fast i call out eighty miles an hour says bullard close to my ear and a moment later pulls the rope for a grade crossing woo 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 answers the deep iron voice too long and too short calls as the code requires year ago killed two men here he shouts as we whiz over the road struck buggy through men sixty feet i wonder how far we would throw them now in the two hundred and six miles run to the mississippi we stop only once for water at mendota and at galesburg nine minutes wasted for the two and the gale blowing harder our schedule makes allowance for no stops every moment from our actual going is so much dead time that must be fought for second by second and made up drive her as he will with all the cunning of his hand bullard can score but small gains against the wind and some of those he loses at mendota we have made up seven minutes but we pull out thirteen minutes late at princeton we are fifteen minutes late at galva fourteen minutes at galesburg eight minutes but we pull out twelve minutes late then we make the last forty-three miles including bridges towns grades and curves in forty-four minutes and draw into burlington at one twenty-two a m on time to the dot this because bullard had sworn to do it also because the road beyond galesburg runs west instead of southwest and it is easier for a train to bore straight through a gale head-on than to take it from the quarter we took the big steady curve at princeton a downgrade helping us at a hundred miles an hour so bullard declares and what he says about engine driving i believe indeed these great bursts can be measured only by the subtle senses of an expert since no registering instrument has been devised to make a reliable record across the twin high bridges that span the bureau creeks we shot with a rush that left the reverberations far back in the night like two short barks and just as we rounded a curve before these bridges i saw a black face peering down from the boiler top while a voice called out war 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 to which startling apparition bullard undisturbed replied war 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 then the head disappeared dan from his side was telling bullard that he had seen the safety light for the bridges and bullard was answering something about hitting it up harder how these men understand each other in such tumult is a mystery to one with ordinary hearing but somehow they manage it halfway between kewanee and galva a white light suddenly came into view far ahead i knew it for the headlight of a locomotive coming toward us on the parallel track already we had met two or three trains and swept past them with a smashing of sound in air but this headlight seemed different from the others paler in its lustre not so steady in its glare the ordinary locomotive comes at you with a calm staring yellow eye that grows until it gets to be a huge full moon but it comes gradually without much jumping or wavering this light danced and flashed like a great white diamond i watched it with a certain fascination and as it came nearer and nearer realized that here was a train of a different kind from the others coming down on us at terrific speed and bullard shouted number eight with the mail then added as the train passed like the gleam of a knife she's going too end of the locomotive engineer part one the locomotive engineer part two of careers of danger and daring this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org careers of danger and daring by cleveland moffett the locomotive engineer part two 
we pick up some engine lore and hear about the death of Giddings. The next day, with comfortable rocking chairs to sit in and a row of hotel windows before us, Bullard and I found time for engine chat, and I was well content. First I asked him about putting his head out of the cab window there at Greg's Hill and elsewhere. Was it to see better? said I. No, said Bullard. It was to hear better and to smell better. Hear what? Smell what? Hear the noises of the engine. If any little thing was working wrong, I'd hear it. If there was anywhere on the bearings, I'd hear it. Why, if a mouse squeaked somewhere inside of 590, I guess I'd hear it. Then he went on to explain that the ordinary roar of the engine, which drowned everything for me, was to him an unimportant background of sound that made little impression, and left his ears free for other sounds. I get so accustomed to listening to an engine, he added, that often up home, talking with my wife and child, I find myself trying to hear sounds from the roundhouse, and after a run, I talk to people as if they were deaf. You spoke about smelling better. That's right. I can smell a hot box in a minute, or oil burning. All engineers can. Why, there was... This led to the story of poor Giddings, killed on 590 three years before, through this very necessity of putting his head out of the cab window. Giddings had Bullard's place, and was one of the most trusted men in the Burlington employ. You saw last night, said Bullard, how the boiler in 590 shuts off the engineer from the fireman, and probably you noticed those posts along the road that hold the tell-tale strings. They're to warn crews on freight car tops when it is time to duck for bridges. Well, Giddings was coming along one night between Bigsville and Gladstone. That's about ten miles before you get to the Mississippi. He was driving her fast to make up time, sixty miles an hour easy, and he put his head out to hear and to smell the way I've explained it. There must have been a post set too near the track, and anyway, 590's cab is extra wide. So the first thing he knew, and he didn't know that, his head was knocked clean off, or as good as that, and there was 590, her throttle wide open, tearing along, with a fireman stoking for all he was worth, and a dead engineer hanging out the window. So they ran for eight miles, and Billy Maine, he was firing, never suspected anything wrong, for of course he couldn't see, until they struck the Mississippi Bridge at full speed. You remember crossing the bridge just before we pulled in here. It's 2,200 feet long, and we always give a long whistle before we get to it, and then slow down. That's the law, he said, smiling. And besides, there's a draw to look out for. When he heard no whistle this time, Billy Maine jumped around quick to where Giddings was, and then he saw he had a corpse for a partner. Another question I asked was about stopping a train at great speed for an emergency. How quickly could they do it? I've stopped, said Bullard, in 950 feet, pulling five cars that were making about 62 miles an hour. I don't know what I could do with this new train, only three cars, and going 80 or 90 miles an hour. That's a hard proposition. Would you reverse her? No, sir. All engineers who know their business will agree on that. I'd shut the throttle off and put the brakes on full, but I wouldn't reverse her. If I did, the wheels would lock in a second, and the whole business would skate ahead as if you'd put her on ice. Then we talked about the nerve it takes to run an engine, and how a man can lose his nerve. It's like a lion tamer who wakes up one morning and finds that he's afraid. Then his time has come to quit taming lions, for the beasts will know it if he doesn't, and kill him. There are men who can stand these high-speed runs for ten years, but few go beyond that term, or past the forty-five-year point. Slow-going passenger trains will do for them after that. Others break down after five years. Many engineers, skilled men too, would rather throw up their jobs than take the run Bullard makes. 
not that they feel the danger to be so much greater in pushing the speed up to seventy eighty or ninety miles an hour but they simply cannot stand the strain of doing the thing this doubling up is what breaks my heart said bullard since they've put on their new schedule i have to divide five ninety with another fellow john kelly takes her on the fast run east while i wait here and rest and so i've lost my sweetheart and I don't feel near as much interest in her as I did. You see, she ain't mine any more. And between you and me, he added confidentially, I don't think 590 likes it much herself. You see, engines are a good deal like girls, after all. The next night, in workman's garb again, I made my way to a gloomy roundhouse, ready for the run to Omaha. I was to ride the second relay as far as Creston, on locomotive 1201, with Jake Myers in the cab, so I had been informed. Being hours ahead of time, I saw something of roundhouse life. First, I followed a gaunt, black-faced Swede with stubby beard through his duties as locomotive hostler, saw him take the tired engines in hand as they came in one after another from hard runs, and care for them as stabler ostlers care for horses. There were fires to be dropped in the clinker pit, coal and wood to be loaded in from the chutes, water tanks to be filled, sand boxes looked after, and finally there was the hitching fast of the weary monsters in empty stalls, whither they were led from the lumbering turntable with the last head of steam left over dead fire boxes. And now spoke the Swede. Dem big passenger engines can weary easy climb over dem blocks and go through the brick wall. And he pointed to a great semicircle of cold engine noses ranged along not two feet from the roundhouse wall. Later on, in the dimly lighted locker room, I listened to roundhouse men swapping yarns about accidents, and to threats of a fireman touching a certain yardmaster set apart by general consent for a licking. Finally, an Irishman came in, James Byron, and for all his good-natured face, he seemed in ill humor. It turned out that he had just received a hurry order to take 1201 out in Myers's place. Jake is sick, he said, and they've sent for me, but I'm sick, too, was in bed with the grip, just took ten grains of quinine. Say, I ain't any more fit to run an engine than I am to run a Sunday school. Then he began pulling on his overalls, while the others laughed at him, told him he was scared of the fast run, and said good-bye with mock seriousness. But Byron showed himself a good soldier, and soon was working over 1201 with a will, inspecting every inch of her, torch in hand, and he assured me he would take her through all right, grip or no grip. And take her through he did. At 1.16 a.m., my old friend, Locomotive 590, brought the flyer up from Chicago, six minutes ahead of the schedule. Kelly had done himself proud this time, and six minutes later, on time to the minute, we drew out behind 12.01, with Byron handling her and 70 tons of mail following after. Our fireman was named Bellamy. He wore isinglass goggles against the heat, and in his way was a humorist, as I discovered presently, when he came close to me, we were running at a sixty-mile gate, and, grinning like a Dante demon, remarked slowly, Say, if we go in the ditch, will you come along? The first feature of this run was some trouble with the feed pipe from the tank, which brought us to a sudden standstill in the open night with a great hissing of steam. "'What is it?' I asked of Bellamy, while Byron, grumbling maledictions, hammered under the truck. "'Check valve stuck. Water can't get to the boiler.' "'How did he know it?' "'Water gauge.' "'What if he hadn't noticed it?' Bellamy smiled in half-contempt. "'Say, if he hadn't noticed it for fifteen minutes,' We'd have been sailing over them trees about this time, in pieces. She'd have bust her boiler. Five minutes lost here, and we were off again, running presently into thick fog, then into rain, 
and finally into a snowstorm. Never shall I forget the illusion, due to our great speed, that the flakes were rushing at us horizontally, shooting upward in sharp curves over the engine's headlight. And, as we swept on, the shadow of 1201 advanced beside us on the stretch of white snow as smoothly and silently as the tail of an eclipse. The engine itself was a noisy, hurrying affair, but the engine's shadow was as calm and quiet as a cloud. And I recall that the swiftness of our rush this night caused in me neither fear nor any particular emotion, although this was practically the same experience that had stirred me so the night before on 590, and I realized that riding on a swift locomotive may become a matter of course like other strange things. End of The Locomotive Engineer Part 2「The Locomotive Engineer – Part 3 – Of Careers of Danger and Daring – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Careers of Danger and Daring – By Cleveland Moffat – The Locomotive Engineer – Part 3 – Some Memories of the Great Record-Breaking Run from Chicago to Buffalo – there is a place in New York, the very last place one would think of, where stories without end may be heard about locomotives and the men who drive them. It is not a place of grime and steam, but a quiet and luxurious club spreading over the top floor of a very tall building on 42nd Street, and here every day at luncheon time railroad officials gather, superintendents, managers, and various heads of departments men who may have grown prosperous and portly, but are always proud to talk about the boys at the throttle and recall experiences of their own in certain exciting runs. In the wide hall near the entrance of this transportation club is a driving wheel, green painted, from the DeWitt Clinton, the first locomotive that drew a passenger train in the state of New York. It is scarcely larger than a wagon wheel, though made of iron, and an inscription sets forth how it made the historic run from Albany to Schenectady on August 9, 1831. The walls show many pictures, famous locomotives, scenes of accidents, and there are thrilling memories here in abundance if one have with him some veteran of the road to recall them. It's not always the most serious accidents that frighten a man most, remarked a high official on the New York Central one day, while the rest of us listened. One of the worst scares I ever had was on a freight train when there really wasn't anything to be scared about. We had just pulled out of Ottumwa, Iowa, one dark night, with a caboose full of passengers, when rump, ump, bang, rip, you never heard such a racket. First one end of the car was lifted up off the rails and slammed down again, and then the other end was treated the same way. Up and down we went, bump, 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 and smash went the window, and out went the lights. Now, what do you suppose it was? Hog under the wheels, suggested one of the group. More likely a mule, said another. There's nothing so tough as the hind leg of a mule. Isn't a car wheel made that'll cut through one. It wasn't a mule or a hog, and it wasn't anything alive but it got us into a panic all right. We waved a lantern-like fury to the engineer ahead, but he didn't see it for a good while, and we just bumped along, expecting every second to be split into kindling wood. We stopped at last, and found it was a beer keg. Yes, sir, an empty beer keg that had got caught under the caboose between the rear axle and the bolster of the truck, and had rolled along over the ties with the car balanced on it like a man riding a rail wasn't broken either. No, sir, not a bit. And we had to chisel through every blamed hoop before we could get it out. Talk about making things strong. That beer keg was a wonder. I had a more exciting experience than that, said another official. He was in the freight handling department. It was a long time ago, yes, back in 63. I remember getting out at a station near Cincinnati to look at some soldiers, and before I knew it, the train started. 
I was up by the engine, and as the drivers began to turn, I jumped on the cow-catcher. You see, I had often ridden there, being a railroad man, and the engineer knew me. Everything went well for a few miles, and I sat on the bumper enjoying the rush of air, for it was a hot summer's day. But presently, as we swung round a curve, the engine gave a fearful shriek, and just ahead I saw a farmer's wagon crossing the track. There were two old men on the seat, and an old white horse in the shafts. The men were so busy talking, they never heard the whistle, or perhaps they were deaf. Anyhow, we were right on them before they looked up, and then they were too dazed to do anything. One of them made a grab for the reins, but I saw it was too late, and I drew my legs up off the bumper and leaned back against the end of the boiler. I must have made a picture as I crouched there. And the next second... Well, said somebody, well, I guess you wouldn't care to hear how things looked the next second. We struck the white horse just back of his forelegs, and I had him on my lap for a hundred yards or so. No, it didn't hurt me, but it wasn't pleasant. The two old men? I don't think they felt anything. It was so sudden. They just passed out. No, I didn't see them, but I can tell you this. I've never ridden on the cowcatcher of a locomotive since that day. There followed some talk about fast runs, and all agreed that for out-and-out -out excitement there is nothing in railroading to equal a man's sensations in one of those mad bursts of speed that are ventured upon now and then by locomotives in record-breaking trials. The heart never pounds with apprehension in a real accident as it does through imminent fear of an accident and so great is the nerve strain and brain strain upon the men who drive our ordinary flyers that three hours in a stretch is as much as the staunchest engineer can endure running at fifty or sixty miles an hour so you see said one of the officials the problem of higher speeds than we have at present involves more than boiler power and strength of machinery and the swiftness of turning wheels it involves the question of human endurance we can build engines that will run a hundred and fifty miles an hour, but where shall we find the men to drive them? Already we have nearly reached the limit of what eyes and nerves can endure. I guess we'll have to find a new race of men to handle those locomotives of the future that they talk so much about. He went on to consider the chance of color blindness in an engineer, and told how the men's eyes are regularly tested by experts, who put before them skeins of various colored yarns, and make them pick out green from red, and so on. It is not pleasant to think what might happen if an engineer's eyes should suddenly fail him, and he should mistake the danger light for safety, and go ahead at some critical moment, instead of stopping. Nor does one like to fancy what might happen if an engineer should go mad at his post. I know one case where an engineer did go mad, remarked a superintendent. He was one of our most experienced men, and had held the throttle for years on the fastest trains. Then one Sunday, for no reason at all, he went to the roundhouse, got out the pony locomotive, that's the one fixed up with a little parlor over the boiler, and easy chairs and polished wood. It makes a pretty observation car for big officials. Well, he got her out and started lickety-split up the main line, running wild and without orders. He stopped at Mott Haven and told the men he wanted the pony rebuilt and silver-plated. Crazy as a loon, you see. Yes, he's in the asylum now, poor fellow. That was his last run. After this, one of the group gave his memories of the famous speed trial on the Lakeshore Road, when five locomotives in relays, driven by picked men, set out to beat all records in a run of 510 miles from Chicago to Buffalo. This was in October 1895, and I suppose such elaborate preparations for a dash over the rails were never made. All traffic was suspended for the passage of this racing special. Every railroad crossing between Chicago and Buffalo was patrolled by a section man. That alone meant 1,300 guards and every switch was spiked half an hour before the train was due. The chief officials of the Lakeshore Road proposed to ride this race in person, and if possible, smash the New York Central's then-recent world's record 
of sixty three point six one miles an hour including all stops over the four hundred thirty six and a half miles between new york and buffalo they had before them a longer run than that and hoped to score a greater average speed per mile but they wished to come through alive and were taking no chances it was half past three in the morning and frosty weather when the train started from chicago with mark floyd at the throttle and various important people general managers superintendents editors etc on the cars behind there were two parlor coaches weighing ninety two thousand five hundred pounds each and a millionaire's private car one of the finest and heaviest in the country weighing one hundred nineteen thousand five hundred pounds which made a total load counting engine and train of something over two hundred tons the first relay was eighty-seven miles to elkhart indiana and the schedule they hoped to follow required that they cover this distance in seventy-eight minutes including nine slowdowns eighty-seven miles in seventy-eight minutes was well enough but the superintendent of the western division had set his heart on doing it in seventy-five minutes and had promised mark floyd two hundred good cigars for every quarter of a minute he could cut under that time but alas for human plans between upgrades and the darkness they pulled into elkhart at five minutes to five which was eighty-five minutes for the eighty-seven miles not bad going but it left them seven minutes behind the schedule and left mark to console himself with his old clay pipe one hundred and thirty-one seconds were lost at elkhart in changing locomotives and it was three minutes to five when big five nine nine with dave loose in the cab turned her nose toward the dawning day and started for toledo one hundred thirty three miles away great things were expected in this relay for about half of it was straight as a bird's flight and downgrade too so that hopes were high of making up lost time especially as loose had the reputation of stopping at nothing when it was a question of getting there he certainly did wonders and five minutes after the start he had the train at a sixty-two mile gait and ten minutes later at a sixty-seven mile gait then they struck frost on the rails and the speed dropped while the time-takers studied their stop-watches with serious faces at ten minutes to six they reached waterloo and the long straight stretch as they whizzed past the station Dave pulled open his throttle to the last notch and yelled to his fireman. Here was where they had to do things. Butler was seven and a half miles away, the first town in the down grade, and they made it in six minutes and forty seconds, nearly sixty-eight miles an hour. In the next seven miles, Dave pushed her up to seventy an hour, then to seventy-two and a half, and let her out in a great burst which made the passengers sit up and showed for several miles a top-notch rate of eighty-seven miles an hour. Nevertheless, taking account of frost and slowdowns, they barely finished the relay on schedule time, so that for the whole run they were still seven minutes behind time. The schedule they had set themselves called for such tremendous speed that it seemed almost impossible to make up a single lost minute. The third relay was one hundred eight miles to Cleveland, and they did it in a hundred and four minutes, including many slowdowns and a heartbreaking loss of four minutes when a section hand red flagged the train and brought it to a dead stop from a seventy mile gate because he had found a broken rail. The officials were in such a state of tension that they would almost have preferred chancing it on the rail to losing those four minutes. There is a point of eagerness in railroad racing where it seems nothing to risk one's life. The train drew out of Cleveland nineteen minutes behind the time they should have made for a world's record. Every man had done his best, every locomotive had worked its hardest, but fate seemed against them, and hopes of beating the Central's fast run were fading rapidly. The fourth relay was to Erie, ninety-five and a half miles, and some said that Jake Gardner, with 598, might pull them out of the hole, but the others shook their heads. At any rate, Jake did better than those who had preceded him, and he danced that train along at seventy-five, eighty, eighty-four miles an hour, so the watches said, 
and averaged sixty-seven miles an hour for the whole relay. It's the kind of thing that makes you taste your heart and packs a week into ten minutes, said the superintendent, telling about it. You may take one ride smashing around curves at eighty miles an hour, but you'll never take another. Still, in spite of these brave efforts, they pulled out of Erie fifteen minutes late, and started on the last relay with gloomy faces. It was eighty-six miles to Buffalo, the end of the race, and they must be there by eleven thirty-one to win, which called for an average speed of over seventy miles an hour, including slowdowns. No train in the world had ever approached such an average, and their own racing average since leaving Chicago was much below it. So what hope was there? There was hope in a tall, sparely built man named Bill Tunkey, whom nobody knew much about except that he was a good engineer with a rather clumsy ten-wheel locomotive not considered very desirable in a race. All the other locomotives had been eight-wheelers. Still, the new engine had one advantage, that she carried water enough in her tank for the whole run, and need not slow up to refill as the others had done. She had another advantage, that she carried Tunky, one of those men who rise up in sudden emergencies and do things, whether they are possible or not. It was not possible, everybody vowed, to reach Buffalo Creek by 1131. All right, said Tunky, quietly, and then, Within forty rods of the start, he had his engine going thirty miles an hour, and he pressed her harder and harder, until eleven miles out of Erie, she struck an eighty-mile pace, and held it as far as Brockton, when she put forth all her strength, and did a burst of five miles in three and a half minutes, one of these miles at a rate of ninety-two and a quarter miles an hour, as the watches showed. And I never want any more of that in mine said the superintendent. The next town was Dunkirk, where a local ordinance put a ten-mile limit on the speed of trains. Tunky smiled as they roared past the station at more than eighty. A crowd lined the tracks here, for the telegraph had carried ahead the news of a hair-raising run. That crowd was only a blur to staring frightened eyes at the car windows. The officials were beginning to realize what kind of an engineer they had ahead this time. Whiz! How they did run! War! War! barked the little bridges, and were left behind. Hoo! bellowed a tunnel. And rip! Whirr! as they slammed around a double reverse curve with a vicious swing that made the bolts rattle in the last car. Men put their mouths to other men's ears, and tried to say that perhaps Mr. Tunky was getting a little overzealous. Much good that did. Mr. Tunky had the bit in his teeth now, and was playing the game alone. At eleven six they swept past Silver Creek, with twenty-nine miles to go, and twenty-five minutes to make it in. Hurrah! They had made up time enough to save them. At eleven twenty they passed Lake View. Twelve miles more and eleven minutes, yelled somebody, waving his hat. Toboggan slide all the way, yelled somebody else. We'll do it easy. Hooray! They passed Athol Springs at 11.24, all mad with excitement. They had seven minutes left for eight miles, and were cheering already. We'll make it with a half a minute to spare, said the only man in the private car who was reasonably cool. He was six seconds out of the way, for they crossed the line twenty-six seconds before 11.31, and won the race by less than half a minute, beating the New York Central's record per mile on the whole run by a fraction of a second, and beating the whole world's record in the last relay by several minutes, the figures standing, Tunky's figures, eighty-six miles from Erie to Buffalo, in seventy minutes and forty-six seconds, or an average speed of 72.91 miles an hour. Do? said the official. What did we do? Why, we, we... He paused helplessly, and then added with a grin, Well, we didn't do a thing to Tunkey. End of The Locomotive Engineer, Part 3
the locomotive engineer part four of careers of danger and daring this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. careers of danger and daring by cleveland moffett the locomotive engineer part four we hear some thrilling stories at a roundhouse and reach the end of the book it was in the roundhouse at forty-fifth street a place of drip and steam and oil smears that i listened to bronson and lewis two good men at the throttle as they held forth on the subject of killing people with an engine after all it's an easy death said bronson i know said lewis but i don't like it just the same i mean killing em last one i killed observed bronson was a woman wife of a congressman they said all done up in furs member her up by new rochelle yes sir there at the platform end where they've made a path over the tracks too lazy to follow the road those folks are take a short cut and get killed well this congressman's wife she sauntered across just as i came through with the express never turned her head never heard the whistle queer about women ain't it lewis nodded had four minutes to make up and we were going good fifty-five an hour easy slammed the brakes on but pshaw congressman's wife she stopped the last second and that settled it if she'd taken one more step i'd have scraped by her but she stopped had to kill her what's a man to do why did she stop i asked oh some idea probably forgot where she was nice lady makes a man sick tell you what i think said lewis i think there's women start across a track to take a chance if they get hit it's all right and if they don't it's all right same as girls pull leaves off a flower to see if some fellow loves em there was she didn't do that put in bronson i don't say she did but some might there was a woman up at larchmont walked across in front of me the other day had a baby too in her arms now why should a woman start over four tracks just as i was coming and walk slow if she didn't want to take a chance mind you i was on the far side and she had to cross three tracks before she got to mine and all the time i had the whistle wide open why a dog would have heard that whistle and got out of the way did you i began hit her i didn't know at the time it was such a close call thought i had but i found out afterward she got past by the skin of her teeth bet you she'd had some trouble thought she might as well quit the game and take the baby along then maybe she was glad when she got across safe can't tell reflected bronson i believe there's such a thing as people getting drawn to a train i don't mean by the suction but drawn by the idea of its going so blamed fast and being so strong especially people sick or down on their luck now last year i was coming through rye one morning and as i struck the bridge after that reverse curve i saw two young fellows running along the number three track away from me i was on number one track so they were all right but as i came up they both swung over to number one and i cut em all to bits turned out they were a couple of lads that had tramped it down from boston goin to enlist they were weak and hungry and i think they just gave up to the train because they couldn't help it might be said bronson tell ye who was the nerviest man i ever killed went on lewis fellow in west haven say but we were coming that night northampton express ye know and a downgrade over the salt meadows first thing i knew a man was standing at the side of the track fairly close but not where he'd get hit i thought he was some friend of mine in west haven trying to make me whistle but when i got near him say a hundred feet away he stepped out between the rails and stood there a few seconds with his arms lifted and a smile on his face quite a pretty smile then just as i was on him he turned and knelt between the rails i got the brakes on quick as i could emergency and everything 
but I couldn't stop her in less than a length and a half, and, well, I guess you don't want to know what that engine looked like when I went over her. I know, said Bronson. They scatter something terrible. Say, I've noticed that sort of pleasant look in their faces, too. Once I was waiting on a siding, and a man came up and spoke to me very polite, and wanted to know if I'd please give him a drink of water. I told him the water in my tank was too warm to drink, but I let him have my cup and showed him where there was a spring right near. He thanked me and walked over to it, and I watched him bend down and take two good drinks, then he brought the cup back and thanked me again. Any train along here soon? he asked. Which way? said I. Don't matter which way, said he. There's an up train due now, said I. She's the one I'm waiting for. Is she a fast train? he asked. Fair, said I, about fifty an hour along here. That's good, said he, and I wondered what he meant. He seemed like a nice man. Pretty soon along came the up train, and I saw him run down the track to meet her. Then he stopped, faced sideways, and let himself fall square across the rails. Say, I was mighty glad I'd fixed it so that he had that drink of water. That was his last drink. Queer how they like to be hit by a fast express, reflected Lewis, when the slow freight would do just as well. Now that man at West Haven, the one who took it kneeling down, he'd waited around the tracks all day. The section gang saw him, and he wasn't doing a thing but picking out a train fast enough for him. He'd stand ready for one, but when she'd turn out to be an accommodation or something slow, he'd step away. Didn't propose to shake hands with anything under fifty an hour. Mine was the first one suited him. Do you ever think of their faces? I asked. Ever see them at night, the way they looked when you struck them? No, said Bronson. Can't say I ever do. Neither did Lewis, and I judge that engine drivers are not deeply affected by these sad occurrences, which is fortunate, for few escape them. Indeed, in going about from engine to engine, I found the following dialogue repeated over and over again. Ever in a collision? No, sir. Ever go off the track? No, sir. Ever kill anybody? Oh, yes. Why, only last week I struck a... Then would follow a story of sudden death. And they all spoke in a kindly but matter-of-fact way, as if these swift executions were part of their business. And I have it from a veteran that any engine driver would sooner hit a man than a hog, for a hog is very apt to wreck the train. A hog is worse than a horse, whereas a man makes no trouble. He simply gets killed. Near the Roaring Roundhouse at Mott Haven is another interesting place, the Young Men's Christian Association car, which is not a car at all, but a dingy shed built of four cars, and serving as a lunchroom, washroom, reading room, and sleeping room for men of the trains. This is a homely refuge spot, where any morning we may meet engineers resting after a hard night's run, or making ready to go out again. Let us drop in and join one of the groups. Here is a man telling about the mad run Big Arthur made the other night down from Albany. We just get the tale of the story. So the superintendent, he ripped around about how they were twenty-seven minutes late, and Big Arthur, he sat in the cab and never said a word. Now, says the superintendent, rather sarcastic, I suppose you know this is the Empire State Express you're running. Yep, says Big Arthur. Well, do you know what time she's supposed to pull into the Grand Central? Yep, says Big Arthur again, and that's all he did say. But holy smoke, how they went! Had those porters on the private car scared green. A hundred miles an hour some of the way, and they came in on time to the dot. Oh, you can't beat these new engines with the firebox over the trailer. But say, wasn't that great when Big Arthur snapped out yep to the old man? I asked if I might see Big Arthur, and one of the engineers said he'd be along pretty soon, and in the meantime he told me about the individuality of locomotives, how one is good-tempered and willing, while another is cranky, how the same locomotive will act differently at different times, 
just as people have whims, and how some locomotives are fated to ill luck, so that nobody wants to drive them. Take these ten new engines the company's just put on. They're the finest and strongest made, a whole lot better than the ones we've thought were wonders on the Empire State. They're beauties, and all exactly alike, measurements all the same. But every one of em has its own points, good and bad. One will go faster than another with just the same steam. One will pull a heavier load with less coal. And very likely there'll be some kind of a hoodoo on one of them. Takes time, though, to find out these things. It's like getting acquainted with a man. Other men came in now, and the talk changed to accidents. I asked if an engineer plans ahead what he will do in a collision. It seemed reasonable that a man always under such menace would have settled his mind on some prospective action. But they laughed at the idea, and declared that an engineer can no more tell how he will act in an emergency than the ordinary citizen can say what he would do in a fire, or how he would meet a burglar. One engineer would jump, another would stick to his throttle, and the chances of being killed were as good one way as the other. The mention of a burglar led one of the newcomers to tell of William Powell's adventure with some Sing Sing convicts. Powell was the oldest engineer on the New York Central. He died a year ago, and this thing happened back in the seventies. It seems there was a trestle over the track about half a mile below the Sing Sing station, and on this trestle some convicts working in the quarry used to run little cars loaded with stone and dump them into the larger cars underneath. Of course, they worked under the surveillance of well-armed guards. On one occasion, however, four or five convicts outwitted the guards by dropping from the trestle upon the tender of a moving locomotive, and the first thing the engineer knew, he was set upon by a band of desperate men, who covered him and his fireman with revolvers. At the same moment, half a dozen shots rang out, and bullets came crashing through the cab sides from the guards firing at random after the fleeing engine. Altogether it was quite the reverse of pleasant for William Powell. "'Out you go now, quick,' said the convicts. "'We'll run this engine ourselves.' The engine was number 105, Powell's pride and pet, and he could not bear to have unregenerate hands laid upon her, so he spoke up very politely. Let me run her for you, gentlemen. I'll go wherever you say. They agreed to this, and some distance down the line left the engine and departed into the woods. And the joke of it was, concluded the narrator, that the revolvers those convicts had were made of wood painted black, and couldn't shoot any more than the end of a broom. It was a big bluff, but it worked. "'Wasn't any bluff when Denny Casson got held up at Sing Sing,' said another engineer. "'Convicts had revolvers all right that trip, and Denny threw up his hands same as any man would. That was twenty years ago on old engine 89. It was right at the Sing Sing station, and three of em jumped into the cab all of a sudden, and told Denny to open her up, and you bet he did. Then they told him to jump, and he jumped.' but first he managed to fix her tank valves so she'd pump herself full of water and stop before she'd gone far. That was Denny's great scheme, and he walked along laughing to think how mad those convicts would be in a few minutes. It turned out, though, that Denny spoiled a nice trap they'd laid up at Terrytown to catch those fellows when they got there. You see, the telegraph operator wired up the line that a runaway locomotive was coming with three escaped convicts on her, and the train dispatcher at Terrytown just set the switch so the locomotive would sail plump over a twelve-foot stone embankment down into the Hudson River. That's what would have happened to those convicts if Denny had left his tank valves alone. But, of course, 89 got waterlogged long before she reached Terrytown. She just kicked out her cylinder ends a few miles up the track and stopped. Then the convicts climbed down and skipped away. Two of them got caught afterward, but there was one they never caught. Presently, somebody reported that Big Arthur was out in the roundhouse getting 2994 ready to take out the Empire State. 
it was clear enough that big arthur was an important figure in the eyes of these begrimed men and setting forth across the yards i came upon him presently torch in hand looking over his deep purring locomotive against the dangers of the run another engineer by the firebox was discussing a theory of some of the boys that a man can run his locomotive by his sense of time as well as by a watch denny casson says he'd agree to take the empire state from albany to new york and keep her right on the dot all the way and bring her in on the minute just by feeling what do ye think of that that's possible said big arthur a man can feel how fast he's going he's got to judge big speed by feeling for there ain't any speed recorder that's much good say above ninety miles an hour at the first opportunity i explained to big arthur and his friend that i would very much like to draw upon their experience for some thrilling incidents in engine driving tell him about the time you went in the river suggested big arthur that was way back in sixty nine said the other when i was firing for boney casson the brother of denny it was in winter a bitter cold day and the hudson was so gorged with ice that part of the jam had squeezed over the bank and torn away our tracks so pretty soon when we came along with twenty-three cars of a train of merchandise why in we went and the old engine troy just skated ahead on her side into the river smashed through the ice down to the bottom and pulled thirteen cars after her you couldn't see a piece of that engine above water as big as your hand and how i got out alive is more than i know guess i must have jumped anyhow there i was on the broken floe and i could hear the old troy grinding away in the river turning up water and ice like a crazy sea serpent she struggled for nearly a minute before her steam was cold and her strength gone then she lay still dead i looked around for boney at first i didn't see him i thought he'd gone down shore and so he had but just as i was looking I saw a big black thing heave up through the ice, and I heard a queer cry. Well, that was Providence, sure. It seems the engine had ripped her cab clean off as she tore through the ice, and here was the cab coming up bottom side first, with Boney inside hanging on to a brace and almost dead. I hauled him out, and then we scrambled ashore over the wrecked cars. They were full of flour, and the barrels were all busted open so by the time we reached the bank we looked like a twin santa claus made of paste and three-quarters drowned at that but boney stuck to his throttle i remarked yes said the other he stuck to his throttle the boys generally do after this i asked big arthur for a story but he assured me he couldn't think of anything special tell about that woman on eleventh avenue said his friend yes said i tell about her oh said big arthur that wasn't much i was pulling a freight train down eleventh avenue one day going slow through the city and at thirty-fifth street a woman turned down the track ahead of me i whistled but she never heard me she was going marketing and couldn't think of anything else i saw i'd strike her sure there wasn't time to stop so i ran along the boiler side to the pilot and got there just as we were on her another second and she'd have been under the wheels i braced myself and made a jump at the woman and struck her back of the neck with a shove that sent her sprawling off the track with me after her you see i had to jump hard or i'd have stayed on the track myself and gone under the engine did it end in a romance i asked romance nothing exclaimed big arthur that woman got up so mad why she called me names and clawed the skin off my face until well i couldn't get shaved for three weeks afterward in about a minute though she cooled off and somebody told her i'd saved her life which i had and then sir blamed if she didn't go down on her knees and try to kiss my feet and pray i'd forgive her say that's the only time i ever got prayed to here big arthur's fireman whispered something to him and the engineer nodded that's so that's a good story and then he told how an old lady of seventy-five saved a new york central express some years ago at underhill cut 
about a mile south of Garrison's. She's a relative of my fireman, so I know the thing's true. Besides that, the company gave her three hundred dollars. You see, it all happened one winter night, and this Mrs. Groves, that's her name, was the only person near enough to do anything. She lived in a little house beside Underhill Cut, and about four o'clock in the morning she heard a frightful crash, and there was a freight train wrecked right in the cut, and cars piled up three or four deep over the tracks. She knew the express might come along any minute, and of course it was a case of everybody killed if they ever struck that smash-up. So what does she do, this little old lady, but grab up a red petticoat and a kerosene lamp, and run out as fast as she could in her bare feet, yes, sir, and nothing on but her nightgown, right through the snow. That's the kind of a woman she was. Well, she went down the track until she heard the express coming, and then she took her red petticoat and held it up in front of the lamp so as to make a red light. And what's more, it worked. The engineer saw the danger signal, slammed on his brakes, and stopped the train a few car lengths from the wreck. Yes, sir, only a few car lengths. Big Arthur nodded thoughtfully and climbed into the cab. It was time to go. In ending this chapter now, and with it the present series, I venture the opinion that the men who follow these careers of danger and daring, the divers, steeple climbers, and the rest, are very little different from their fellow men, except as they have developed certain faculties by their exercise and established in themselves the habit of courage. They were not born with any longing to do these daring acts, nor with any particular aptitude for them. They have been guided nearly always by the drift of life and by opportunities that presented. As to fear, they have the same capacity for it that we all have, and are serene in their peril only because they feel themselves, by their patience and skill, well armed against it. The steeple climber would be afraid to go down in a diving suit, the lion tamer would be afraid to go up in a balloon, the pilot would be afraid to swing on the flying bars, and so on. I will even go further and say that the average good citizen who is sound of body has as great capacity for courage as any of these men. He could develop it if he cared to. He would develop it if he had to. That is the main point, after all. These men must be brave, they must conquer their fear, and the only trouble with the average man is that nothing ever occurs to show him and those who know him what fine things he could do if the pressure were put upon him. Yet any day the test may come to any one of us. Pain to bear, losses to bear, bereavement to bear, and then the great test. Well, perhaps these humble heroes whose lives we have glanced at may give us a bit of their spirit for our own lives, the brave and patient spirit that will keep us unflinchingly at the hard thing, whatever it be, until we have conquered it. And perhaps we, too, may feel impelled to cultivate the habit of courage. That would be a fine inspiration indeed, and I can only hope that my readers may feel it. End of The Locomotive Engineer Part 4 End of Careers of Danger and Daring by Cleveland Moffat.